Uh, I'm just going to read this too. Uh, in response to Governor Baker's declaration of a public health emergency and the related emergency executive order dated March 12, 2020, Town of Situate Public Meeting shall meet remotely until further notice. This meeting will be recorded and will be posted following the meeting. Public comment will be available via uh, Zoom. Um, this will also be broadcast via Facebook Live through the uh, SCTV Facebook page. Uh, mem community members can also email me at pgates at sit.org with comments. Um, okay. I would like to, um, just a couple of things. We don't usually do this, but we do have a time constraint here. Um, item number four, which is presentations by our medical experts. We just need to be there for 6.30. So if we're somewhere else in the agenda at 6.30, we'll have to move forward to that, okay? Um, other than that, we'll proceed uh, per the agenda. So with that being said, I'd like to hand it over to uh, Ms. Tammy Rundle to celebrate student learning. Good evening. Thank you for having me here tonight. Um, as you know, the high school counseling department facilitates the program of studies and the course selection process for rising ninth through 12th grade students. And this evening, I am excited to share with you a video that was created by the Principal's Student Advisory Council. Uh, this video is the culmination of some of the um, Student Advisory Council students talking about their favorite Situate High School electives. Um, this week, we are in the midst of the course selection process for Situate High School. And this video is being shared with all freshmen during an electives course carousel. Uh, this course carousel is also being facilitated by these student leaders. And during this time, uh, ninth grade students are hearing from teachers and department chairs about the elective course offerings within their respective departments. Hearing from fellow students about the rich array of course, off course offerings can be a powerful tool in helping students reflect upon their high school choices and how these choices may impact their goals, both now and in the future. And as counselors, we work with students to develop <clears throat> courses of study that they would find meaningful and fulfilling. And while we encourage students to take rigorous coursework and challenge themselves in the classroom, we urge students to listen to their inner voice and help them choose courses and subjects they want to explore, emphasizing the whole student. We emphasize the need for students to find balance in their schedule. And you'll see from this video that these students have found much happiness and personal satisfaction in their choices. Uh, so members of the Student Advisory Council are here this evening. And after sharing the video with you, uh, they are more than happy to answer any questions you may have about their course experiences and how their selection of courses are preparing them for the future. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. Bear with me for a second. you see that good yes great here we go hello everybody my name is victor bowker and my favorite elective last year was intro to journalism it was really fun because we got to explore the school and walk around and we got to interview people about issues that we found to be important to us and I even got to interview Dr. McGuire a few times and Mr. Wargo back in the day. That was pretty fun. Uh, we, we would watch movies and write reviews on them, and it's a good pathway to honors journalism as an upperclassman, which is another amazing My book. favorite elective that I've taken so far is the DECA Shark Tank marketing class that I'm taking this year. It's my favorite elective because it's taught me a lot about business, and I think I want to go into a business career when I get older. Hey, everyone. Uh, my name's Chloe, and I actually have two elective courses to talk to you about. Um, the first one is community service learning. It's actually one of the favorite classes I've ever taken at SHS. Um, you identify a problem in society or something you think is a problem in society or in our community and you design a project to um, help alleviate some of that. So I chose mental health in school um, and my friends and I researched um, how nature can be beneficial to that. And we ended up redoing the courtyard that's outside the pack. So all those chairs um, and anything out there, all those plants, that was all a project that we did through community service learning. Um, and it was really, really fun and a really rewarding experience. Um, so I definitely recommend that class. And then the other one 
is international affairs. It's super, super fun, and it's unlike any other course because students get to design um, the course, basically. And what I mean by that is that students get to kind of direct the topic of discussion and what you learn about, um, which I feel like you don't really have the liberty to do in any other class. So it's really, really exciting. It's really fun, and you get to learn about what you want to learn about and what you care about the world. Um, so, yeah, good luck next year. Hi, my name is Jesse, and I took honors intro to programming this year. Um, it's a really nice class because it doesn't teach you skills that are typically taught in other classes, and you get an honors credit for um, taking an elective that you enjoy. I would really recommend taking this class. It's fun, and you don't get bored. Band is a fun elective to take if you play an instrument because of the amazing songs we get to play. You can also make good relationships with upperclassmen and underclassmen. Music tech is a fun class to take because you learn how music is actually created and you can make your own music. Hi everyone, my name is Celia. I'm a junior this year and my favorite elective courses have been Intro to Journalism and Intro to Art. In journalism, I learned a new, more comfortable style of writing and analyzed different pieces of literature, like art, movies, songs, and of course articles too. Intro to Art was one of my favorites because we used mediums that I hadn't before, like clay, different kinds of paint, scratch board, and pencil. I learned a ton of new skills in both courses, and I 10 out of 10 recommend both. Hi, my name is Ara Zusti, and I've taken business, history, and music electives at Situate High School. My favorite one by far has to be Select Choir, which is a full year course. However, we sing a lot of really fun pieces. We do both modern ones and some from history. For example, we did Mozart's Requiem a couple of years ago. Um, it's a really fun class and we actually dive a little bit deeper into the meaning of the text and what the music actually means before we sing it. The rehearsals are a lot of fun and also performing is a lot of fun when we give concerts. So it's a class that I would definitely recommend taking. Hi, my name is Patrick, I'm a junior and uh, I would recommend taking 3D Art 1. I took it this year, it was the first art class I'd taken and uh, I really liked it. Miss Pace is the teacher, and she made it a very uh, understanding at work environment. I was not very good at art, but uh, she helped me learn a lot of things. I was able to be creative and uh, just develop as an artist uh, something I'm not really good at. Definitely recommend 3D Art 1. <clears throat> oh, sorry. Great. Sorry about that. Um, so that was the video. And I just want to thank the students in the Student Advisory Council for their energy, their enthusiasm, and their commitment to this product project. And I would also be remiss if I didn't thank Dr. McGuire, who's been instrumental in putting this video together and providing the students with the opportunities to continue to demonstrate their stellar leadership abilities. Um, so um, with that said, um, some of the students are here tonight. If you had questions and you wanted to ask them, um, but that is my celebration of student learning. Great. That's, that's, uh, was great to see that type of stuff. I know we usually focus on the core curriculum and that sort of stuff. And it's nice to see that uh, students have a choice and they're able to take advantage of the offerings that uh, they're at the high school. So and I, did, I didn't know that it sounds like you can take choir or one of those uh, music classes as an elective, which I was not aware of. That's yeah, yeah. That's great. Yeah. Um, open up to the committee. Anyone, any comments or questions? Nope, I'm all set. Great. Yeah, I just want to echo what Chairman Gates said. I think it's great that we have the students being able to share their experiences and, you know, give, give an idea to the younger classmen what, you know, what, what the classes are that they can take. I'd actually be interested to hear, uh, I, I missed the, the Young, young man's name at the beginning, but hearing the feedback from students about things going on around the schools would actually be great to hear from our perspective because a lot of that doesn't come up to us. But being able to hear it from students is a, you know, it's why we're here and it's a great, great tool for us to have. Awesome. Um, I'd like to just comment that I, th I having a, um, a high school student, I've looked at the course catalog and all the electives that the kids get to choose from are just amazing. Um, and I, I feel like it, um, th their choices can really direct them towards what they might want to do, you know, when they grow up. <laughs> and I don't know about Peter, but I mean, we didn't have, I think, as many, I don't remember that many, that, that variety when we were there. So. <laughs> um, 
but yeah, I, I think that kids have really great opportunities to, to find themselves. Yeah, I agree. Great. All right. Thanks very much. Appreciate to uh, you, Tammy, and all the students uh, for taking the time to, to um, I guess, get recorded for the video and to Dr. McGuire, who offered her assistance. It's good stuff. We like to see that. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Tammy. And that moves us uh, for along the agenda to the student report. I believe we have all three student reps here, uh, Johnny Kinsley, Celia Reese, and Rosie Tertia. Um, each of you are co-hosts, so uh, let's kick it off with Celia. Yep, that's right. All right, hi again, everyone. Thank you again for having us. Um, my first point for today is in a very informal survey of students, I found that most students reported finding Wednesdays in school last week more productive and useful than they imagined. So I think that's looking up for the future. Um, most teachers use that time to reconnect with students on past topics, answer questions, and dedicated extra time in class to schoolwork. Um, my second point is that what you just watched, Principal McGuire's Advisory Council held a course selection presentation for pre um, freshmen, which involved talking to elective teachers and department heads, watching that same video you just watched, and listening to student advice. It was really successful, and we will be um, prepared to present it to Cohort A next Wednesday. And the same information will be forwarded to Cohort C this week as well. Administration sent out a survey for students from grades 5 through 12 to better understand students' perspectives on returning to full-time learning and how students can be best helped for a safe and positive transition. School counselors, administrators, and department chairs are helping to facilitate focus groups over the next week to gain student perspective on returning to school full-time. And my final point is that the language department is offering a new opportunity for students to test for the Massachusetts State Seal of Biliteracy, which is a great thing to have an opportunity for. On to Johnny. Johnny, are you here? I don't know if you're a co-host. If not, if you just raise your hand, I can, we can unmute you. I, is Johnny here? Is his hand raised? Hand raised. Yeah. Sorry, I couldn't raise my hand. There you go. You're good. Thank you. All right. Uh, so MCAS dates are scheduled for the end of May uh, and early June for freshmen to take the biology MCAS and juniors and sophomores to take the English and math tests. Uh, Saturday, the drama club participated in an unofficial virtual festival along with Nanasset, Attleboro, and Hingham High Schools. It was a great day that allowed students to participate with peers uh, from other districts to see other work in the area. The day was highly successful and some of our students walked away with awards from their peers and the directors. Uh, Lily Grazioso received an acting award. Nope. All right, I think I think we lost the last sec the last sentence there, Johnny. Or maybe we lost them. D can you hear me? Now I can, yep. Uh, where did I cut it out? After Lily. Okay. Um, Kendall Christian uh, received a costume award, and Maggie Ayers and Avery Brown received uh, set awards. <clears throat> and for athletics, winter track had their first meet, uh, or has their first meet this week. Uh, football is eagerly awaiting their first game of the year on March 19th, and cheer starts at the first home game on March 26th, and the season will run through April 25th. And I'll pass it on to Rosie. It should be good. Um, I actually don't have anything to add. I think you guys got it all, so thank you. <laughs> all right, thanks. Um, I, I mean, I have to make the comment, Celia, that thank you so much for uh, commenting that the students are finding Wednesdays to be a very productive day. Um, obviously, we had 
feedback on both sides of that decision that we recently made. And it's nice to hear that the students are benefiting from it. That's what we, that's why we voted the way we did. That's why Superintendent Burkett came up with the plan. And um, we're glad that it's working out from, from the perspective of the majority of the students. Thank you for reporting that. You're welcome. It was a very informal, it was like an Instagram question I used for my student gov account, but most of the people who responded reported positive things and with the people I've talked to and the student body is resilient. So I think we'll be okay. I think so too. Yeah. I think we made the right decision for everyone. So, but again, as informal as it is, at least we are hearing positive feedback from the students, which is nice to hear. I think so too. Great. Um, and thanks to, thanks all of the students for reporting. Um, any other comments by the school committee? No. All right. So we still have 12 minutes. I guess that means, I, I think because it's listed on the agenda at 630, I think we have to wait, correct? We never really have times. We got anything on the agenda that can take 10 minutes? Yeah. Um, the minutes? <laughs> we can do the minutes. Actually, why don't we do this one? Um, yeah, that's actually good, Mike. Thanks. Um, under the, I just wanted to mention this. Um, we have an I, agenda item subcommittee reports. Um, I believe that the policy subcommittee met to review a couple of items. Um, we had intended to put this on the agenda for its first reading, but for a couple of reasons, we're not able to do that. So could either uh, Mike or Janice give a quick update on the subcommittee, uh, the policy subcommittee? Um, I think we could probably could, I can take one of them, a uh, couple. Just, just briefly, I don't, I don't want, we don't want to review them, just kind of what, which policies you're, re, you're reviewing and then. Um, sure. we're, we're reviewing um, memorials, uh, public comment in teaching, is it teaching difficult, uh, controversial issues? So when we're looking at other towns to see what their policies are and what the mask policies and we're just comparing them and we're just going to come up with good policies that fit situate okay i don't know if mike wants to add anything to that yeah i, I would just add that i think we came up with pretty decent language on all three in terms of what what fits from either mask uh some of the legal opinions that we receive from our, our lawyers and then just from other towns in the area kind of surprising that some of the other towns don't have policies related to some of these topics, but um, we made good headway in all three. And I know the information's in the school committee's backup. So if any of the other three have any comments and want to just send them out to Janice, Jen, Bill, and I, we can we can review and then have an updated list of policies for the next meeting. Okay. Yeah, it's great. It's just it's just a for just the way we do this. And I believe we have three three readings and then the final vote. Um, so we'll just have to delay the first reading of the three policies until our next meeting. But we, we have done in the past, we have done two readings. Yeah. Minimum. And then vote. we can vote on the second. Okay. Yeah, it's fine. I, I think two is probably appropriate yeah. unless we have some significant, uh, recommendations, but again, just a formality that we can't officially discuss those policies and what you uh, spoke about. Yeah. Um, again, nothing, just, again, more of just a, uh, open meeting law issue. So that's all. Um, so that takes care of subcommittee reports. We do have minutes from October 5th. Is everyone okay if we uh, make a motion uh, to vote on those? To move to approve the October 5th, 2020 school committee minutes as presented. Motion by Mr. Long, is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Hayes. Roll call vote. Uh, Ms. Brandolini? Yes. Ms. Limblom? Yes. Gates is a yes. Mr. Long? Yes. And Mr. Hayes? Yes. All right, we're cruising through the agenda. Uh, let's see what else. Doctor, I mean, can we really go out of, out of order this much? I guess we can. You, you actually need a, a vote to do it, Pete, but yeah. Um, to take it out of order, but so if you have something else, I'll make that motion. 
Uh, Dr. Dutch, would you be able to read the warrant in the next eight minutes? If so, we can vote to make you up next. I can do that. Make All right, do I? Well, we can, we can make a motion later, but. No, you can do it, Mike, go ahead. Uh, make a motion that we take uh, out of the order of the agenda, uh, Dr. Dutch's uh, report. Motion by Mr. Hayes, there second? Second. second. Second by Mr. Long. Quick roll call vote. Gates, yes. Limblom. Yes. Benalini. Yes. Mr. Long. Yes. And Mr. Hayes. Yes. All right. So, uh, Dr. Dutch, you have seven minutes for your warrant. Okay. We've got two warrants. The first one is S210223, total of $263,036.05. Uh, large items uh, was $20,000 in carpeting out of our capital account, which was for the uh, flooring in the library. Out of our LEA budget, we had $99,368 for private school tuitions and $38,524 for collaborative tuitions. Our utilities, electric, $13,987.67 and gas 23,982.58. Those were our only large items on that warrant. The second warrant this evening is S210302. And like the first was signed by committee member Lindblom. The total is $243,415.74. Uh, large ticket items uh, outside of the local budget for the IDEA grant or special ed grant, $28,735 for special ed transportation. Private school tuition, $112,272.39. Again, our gas utilities, $26,130. Uh, and those were our only large items over $5,000. That concludes my report. That was too quick. And Pete, I'll make another motion if I may on the minutes. Sure. And we can make this non, what's called non-pro-tunk, you know, which means we make the motion after we voted. Um, to uh, take out of order the, the minutes uh, on the agenda. Yep, and the subcommittee reports. And the subcommittee reports, yes. Motion by Mr. Hayes, there a second? Second. Second by Ms. Limblom. Roll call vote, Mr. Long? Yes. Ms. Brandolini? Yes. Gates is yes. Uh, Ms. Limblom? Yes. And Mr. Hayes? Yes. All right, thank you for that. That's just an or I appreciate that just to correct to make sure we're uh, following appropriate uh, Robert's rules. It's very rare that we have the situation. So thank you for that. Um, with that being said, we still have five minutes. You, you could take the vote on the budget uh, since there's been no change to that. It's exactly what it was at the budget hearing. Um, let's hold off on that. I just want to hold off on that. Okay. Just hold off. Thank you for the, uh, thank you for that though. Um, do we have the three uh, medical experts here? We do need to make them co-hosts or if you could raise your hands, let's make sure we're all set up. Saw Dr. McBrien and Dr. Lane. I don't know if Dr. Ellerin's here. I, I see. Oh. Let's get you guys all lined up. Is Dr. Lane here? 
Yes. Dr. Lane, if you could raise your hand using the um, Zoom functionality, if you go into participants over to the right by your name, you should be able to raise your hand. There we go. Okay. And then we just need uh, Dr. Ellerin. Is he? He's here? in the waiting room. He's here. And it's six twenty-eight. This is lining up. All right, Dr. Ellerin, if you could um, raise your hands using the functionality, if you find your name over the participants and scroll over your name to the far right, and um, there we go. Well, let's. Gonna... Seth, Seth, could you make Dr. Lane a co-host? He has his hand raised. All right, I think we're getting there. All right, it's uh, 629. Uh, Superintendent Burkhead, could I um, toss this over to you so you could give the introductions and we'll, and, and then we'll make sure that everyone's ready to go. Yes, uh, are all the, the three doctors unmuted or uh, have ability to speak when they're up? Yep. Okay, thank you. But right, I'm gonna share my screen if I could. Thank you, Chairman Gates. Good evening, everyone. Um, start my... Okay, so part of our um, presentation tonight, you know, we've spoken a lot about the science and the medicine and um, a lot of these decisions when people talk about the CDC, the, the, the federal government, and there's, you know, Dr. Fauci. I think we have local medical experts that we've counted on and relied on, and I wanted to make sure that they got an opportunity to speak tonight about our reopening plan and their thoughts. Um, so I want to thank them. I'll just do a quick introduction. Um, and first is um, Dr. Ellerin, Todd Ellerin. Uh, Dr. Ellerin has been Director of Infectious Disease, uh, Diseases and Vice Chairman of the Department of Medicine at the South Shore Hospital in Weymouth, where I was born, uh, 17 years. So missed him by a little bit. He is an Associate Physician at the Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston and an Instructor in Medicine at Harvard Medical School. Uh, additionally, he serves as Medical Director of the Weymouth Department of Public Health and was the Medical technical specialist for SARS, H1N1, Ebola, and now coronavirus at South Shore Hospital. You may recognize him for his medical consult consulting on Channel 5 News. I think he's on TV more than me. And um, I want to thank him for coming tonight. I know he's got a busy schedule. He has to pop out as do, do the other doctors shortly after they speak, but I know they will um, be able to entertain a few questions by the committee. Uh, quickly, just want to introduce in order. So Dr. Ellen will go first and we'll take some questions for him. And then I know he has to pop off. And then um, two members of our local community, uh, respected doctors in our community, but also respected contributors to our medical advisory committee, um, which has done a fabulous job about advising us and guiding us this year. Uh, Dr. Katie McBride is a MD board certified pediatrician and fellow at the American Academy of Pediatrics. She's currently working uh, at Healthcare Self Situate Pediatrics. She went to medical school at Loyola uh, School of Medicine and completed a residency at Rush University Medical Center. In addition to practicing general pediatrics, she's actively involved in numerous nonprofits and other organizations that help others. She grew up in the South Side of Chicago and made the smart move of moving to Massachusetts in 2008 
She's married, has two kids, two dogs, and a cat. Out of uh, round out the chaos in her life. So um, a lot of stuff going on there. And uh, last but not least, Dr. Stephen Lane, who I found out uh, through our conversations this year. Uh, him and I were neighbors at one time in Plymouth, Massachusetts. So uh, good to know that uh, as we were younger. Dr. Lane's got a lot of uh, accolades here. He's an outstanding local doctor. He stir serves the faculty of the University of Mass Medical School in Boston. Uh, he also uh, precepts third and fourth year medical students in the office. Dr. Lane was the recipient of the 2014 Mass Academy of Family Physicians Preceptor of the Year Award uh, in recognition of his exemplary, clinic, exemplary clinical teaching and medical students. Uh, twice awarded the BU uh, Medicine Preceptor of the Year Award. And in 2019, he was awarded the BU School of Medicine Alpha Omega Alpha Chapters Clinically, Clinical Faculty Award. Dr. Lane is also awarded the degree of fellow by the American Academy of Family Physicians awarded to those who have distinguished themselves among their colleagues as well as their communities by their service to family medicine, by their advancement of health care to the American people, and by their professional development through medical education and research. He serves uh, locally here in Situate. He's also our school physician and the U.S. Coast Guard Point Allerton Station physician. He's married and the father of three children. Aside from his time with his family, he enjoys skiing, hiking, and woodworking. I just thought it was very important that um, I give a little background of these uh, outstanding medical experts in their um, intro tonight. So I'll turn it over to uh, Dr. Ellerman in, uh, Ellerman and thank you for coming tonight, doctor. God, can you hear me? Yes. Well, that, that's a really nice introduction. And um, I guess what I wanna say is the fact that you're having this type of preparation, you know, you know that you guys are in good hands and your students and faculty are in good hands. And with people like Dr. Lane, who I know personally, and, and Dr. McBride, I mean, you've got great, you know, uh, consultants that are going to make sure that, that, you know, things go as smoothly as they can during a, during a, in, you know, an uncertain time. I, I think, um, you know, I, I, I'm happy to answer any questions, but what I would say is, you know, overall, the kids are doing great schools for the most part are not major contributors to community transmission. That doesn't mean that students don't get infected and it doesn't mean staff don't get infected because they do, but most of the infections occur outside of the school setting. Why? Because masks are working. The distancing is working and, and even more for kids than adults, for whatever reason, kids seem to be less of a vector of transmission overall and it's surprising i wouldn't have predicted it before this started but it's you know it's one of these kind of silver linings um and um yeah so i, I think that the cdc studies are showing that that uh you know have that this is data driven what i'm saying and also i think it's great news that the that staff are being prioritized that teachers are being prioritized um to get it getting vaccines i mean obviously we would like it if if they were even uh, getting it, you know, earlier than they are, but there's obviously priority lists. And with priority lists, you're going to have, you know, it, it's, it's not a fair process completely. So i um, happy to take any questions, but um, yeah, I'm feeling very good about, um, you know, you guys opening and getting kids back into the classroom. I, I don't know exactly what you're doing right now. I, I assume it's a hybrid model, but um, I'm not entirely sure. Okay, I'd like to open up to the committee for uh, any questions for Dr. Ellerman. Um, I have a question for Dr. Ellerman. Uh, hey, Dr. Ellerman, this is Janice Lindblom uh, from the school committee. And I, have a, uh, I was wondering if you had, um, if you knew, well, it has to do with the viral load of patients that have COVID. And if um, there's a difference between older people and the younger kids in elementary that make it that contributes or makes it possible for them not to be super spreaders? It's a really good question. And, you know, we're learning more and more about viral loads. Um, we are learning that people who are vaccinated, for example, overall have, have less viral loads than people who are unvaccinated. You know, some of the studies with kids um, hasn't necessarily borne out that the viral loads are less. I, I, um, Dr. Lane um, or Dr. McBride, maybe you guys can jump in. You may know the pediatric, pediatric literature better than, better than me. Um, 
in some of the stuff, I was expecting some of the earlier studies to say the viral loads are clearly less. Um, but, you know, it's interesting. Some of the studies, even with asymptomatic versus symptomatic people, you'd expect the viral loads must be higher in symptomatic people. And that hasn't always borne out either. So I want to give a second for um, the, the, the pediatricians to jump in. Um, any newer data that I may be not familiar with? No, I mean, I, I think we're kind of seeing and looking at the, the, the same stuff. I, I haven't seen anything different that it necessarily changes on the amount that you have. Yeah, I, I, you know, you'd expect kids to have, because we're saying kids are less likely to be a vector for transmission, you'd expect them to have vi a less viral loads, but I don't know that the studies have shown that yet. So is there any um, theories as to why they're, you know, uh, less contagious? I, I guess they're not spreaders as much. Is it like just the mechanics of the way it's spread because they're lower? Well, <laughs> well, the density of the, the de density of the ACE2 receptors is, I think, one of the reasons why we think they don't get as sick. But if the virus can't enter the cells and can't, then then it can't really propagate, right? I mean, remember there are more viruses. I mean, I know this is hard to believe, but there are more viruses than there are stars in the sky. Uh, and it's a little hard to believe, but that's what that's really what like the the, the virologists say. And there are lots of viruses that are constantly trying to like get you know, in, infect us in a sense. And most can't infect us um, uh, efficiently or effectively. And I think for, I think it's possible that it has to do with uh, receptors. Um, that may be part of it. There may be other things too, uh, maybe mucosal immunity. I, I think this is a gray area. I don't pretend to know exactly, but, but it, study after study are telling us that, that students are not getting, the young, the kids are not getting infected as much as the adults. The older students are getting getting infected less than the adults, and and the younger students are getting less infected than the older students. So it, it that 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 continues to be a theme that we're seeing um, over and over again. All right. Thank you for that answer. Have and we have a lot of contact. We have a lot of contact tracing studies, by the way, a lot that are showing that kids are not the primary vector in these. Again, not what I would have predicted. With influenza, it's very, it's very different. But this is a, you know, this is an unpredictable virus, and I would just take it as very good news for you guys. Thank you. Sure, Pete. I have one question for all of you. Go, go ahead, Mr. Hayes. Thank you, Pete, and uh, thank you, Dr. Eller. And, and uh, I have, I actually, I have a question. Really, just one question. Uh, and Dr. Lane and Dr. McBride, and I want to. Personally, thank you for all the hard work that you've done for Citrus Schools this this year on the on the MAC. I mean, uh, I really think we've uh, done a terrific job, and 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 uh, just keep our kids as safe as, as humanly possible. And we couldn't do that without your expertise and, and your hard work. And I respect everything you've done so much, and I appreciate it and want to thank you. I have one question, though, and it's regard to the um, uh, situate uh, uh, going to three to six feet of social distancing. And uh, why do you think that's right for situate uh, when the CDC has yet to do that, uh, reduce the six feet social distancing? And uh, do you anticipate the CDC changing that uh, recommendation anytime soon? Um, is, 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 is that for me? Or, or for yeah, anybody? I, I'm, I'm happy to, let me, let, me, let me just take a stab at that. So, so a couple of things, first of all, I think that, you know, the six feet, first of all, we used to say three feet, that was the rule, that was the cutoff. And then we sort of extended it to six feet. Some of this was driven by kind of SARS, back in the day and, and pandemic H1N1. And, and the truth of the matter is, is while probably there's some benefit the further you are away without question, but the, I, think, I think when you look at masking for teachers and students, when you look at teachers that are gonna be six feet away from the, stu from the students, and when you look at kids that are gonna be three feet away, I think, I think that's going to work out well. Why do I say that? I say that because we we know in Europe 
where a lot of the schools are uh, have the distances are three feet away, they haven't seen outbreaks. So there's a lot of places around the world that the real life experiments of three feet have not led to major clusters of, of infections. And so I'm, while you're right, the, the CDC says ideally optimal distance is six feet. If they, you know, that's how they sort of uh, word it. Um, uh, but I do think, I really believe that the three feet, the six feet to three feet is not going to, you're not going to start seeing major outbreaks if the kids are wearing masks uh, as they should be. Oh, and one thing, one thing I want to say, one other thing. Remember, we used to think that these infections were all droplet or airborne, right? And what, what I learned and what some of these uh, aerosol scientists have taught us is that it's, it's a, there's a mix. It's not all or none. So remember, we do think that this virus can sit and kind of be suspended in air for a few hours so at a time before it drops out. So it's probably, you know, the three to six feet when you think of something that can be ge gener that can have an aerosol component probably doesn't make as much of a difference as you might think. So what I really think that underscores is that the masks that we're wearing are really working and the ventilation probably. The ventilation is important, you know, so if you can open windows, open, you know, in, in the warmer months, open windows, even six inches. Six inches of opening windows can completely change the, the circulation of a room. So simple things like that, you know, um, and, um, you know, air that's circulating, even if it circulates four times an hour, let's say, things like that make a big difference. And I think maybe even more important than whether it's three feet or six feet. Dr. McBride or Dr. Lane, do you have, do you share that opinion as well? I certainly do. And I think World Health Organization now is, is saying three feet is acceptable. Um, we have letters from infectious disease specialists in Boston saying that three feet is acceptable. And this is all based on the fact that community spread now is, is lower. Um, and echoing Dr. Ellerin's point about masks, you know, if both parties are wearing masks, I, th I think they say 90% of, of um, y you can prevent 90% of spread by, by both parties wearing the masks. Great. Yep, I would agree. And I, I think, think again, back the question, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, that you just underscore that nothing, nothing else in our precautions change, right? So you just really want to kind of just change one variable. And if we're changing the six feet to three feet for kids, and again, we're emphasizing that it's kids and not adults, um, still in our precautions, we're trying to try to keep adults at the six feet mark. As long as you continue to do all of your hand washing and uh, circulation and mask wearing, um, then the spread should be minimal. No, that's great. Thank you. And, and I mean, I know uh, one of the hopes is as we go forward, all the teachers and staff that want to be vaccinated will have that opportunity um, because, um, I mean, as a practical matter, uh, teachers and kids six feet apart is not always realistic. Uh, so especially in the younger grades. Um, oh. But uh, the I, vaccinations will certainly help there. I'm glad you said that these vaccines are transformative um, without question. They, they're, they have been given to now around the world, literally, I mean, hundreds of millions of people. So uh, you, you know, we have good safety data even you know, beyond six months um, in, in, in given some of the earliest. But the one thing I wanna say is even when you look at our system right now, our health system, we, right now still only have 70% of our staff vaccinated. And that to me is we need to do a better job. And I hope you guys, I hope Situate sets uh, uh, the highest bar and you can get as close to 100% of your faculty vaccinated. Me too. <laughs> We're quickly. trying. We're trying. Quickly, quickly. Uh, Ms. Brinley, I know we had a question, but I was going to jump in first. The, I think that um, th the three to six feet, obviously, I think has been the biggest um, point that's been debating. So the question is, and this is getting into details, is it, is it 
measured between people to people or end of their furniture line or what? So was it like the edge of their desk to the edge of the other desk? Is it from seat to seat or, or what is that three to six foot mark supposed to be measured to and from? That's for any of you. I, I would assume it's from from one one person's mouth to another person's, you know, mouth. Okay. Six foot. Sure. Two. Sure. Great. Okay. Okay, Miss Brandolini, I know you had something. Oh, it was just a quick question. Um, one of my other questions you already answered, but. Um, do you all foresee, especially schools, wearing masks into, this is a, can you use your crystal ball for us and tell us if you see uh, masks being necessary for fall and, uh, you know, there's just no end to that quite yet or in the near future, I would assume. That's a great question. Um, will masks be, I mean, I do believe that um, until, because, because, we're, I'm going to assume that kids are going to begin to get vaccinated um, in like sort of the summer into fall time period. So I do, I do believe my prediction is that it's going to be ultimately when, you know, both parties are vaccinated. I think, I think until the kids are vaccinated, my guess is that there's still going to be masks that are recommended for them. But I, I you know, I could be wrong. It's, it's possible that other countries could have different standards and we could learn things from them but that would be my guess i would i would say yes until until the kids are vaccinated as well yep that makes sense and i kind of love the mask i mean it's not great you know kids don't love the mask but we've also seen like no flu right, right. no our I mean, you know, kids are not snotting on each other. It's great. <laughs> or anyone else. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Pete, may I ask one more? Yeah, go ahead, Mr. Hayes. Um, I just want to get the doctor's opinion. So there's been a lot of discussion on uh, at this point in the pandemic, um, especially with variants, uh, whether your opinions on double masking. Oh. Yeah, that's that's. I, I'm glad you said that. Um, I mean, so so I what I take from the CDC study. Remember that was a study that was done in sort of like mannequins, right? It was a simulated model. So what I take away is that I don't I don't want to see right now a single layer cloth mask. Like I think a single layer cloth mask is potentially problematic. I'm not saying it may, it's better than nothing, but it's really I think that layers, I, I take that to mean layers are good. And when you think about those blue masks that, you know, the, the common ones that we're wearing that we wear in our system, that those have three layers. So actually the other part of that study was they said, if you did this knot and tuck method and you can look at it online, if you haven't seen it, it's very simple. I mean, I can do it and I'm all, I'm far from a surgeon. Like you can, you can, it's just basically how to fit your face the best. So if you have a mask that has multiple layers and it fits your face well, I don't, that's, I don't think you need to double mask, but if you, I think if you want a double mask, you know, go right ahead. I mean, that's the double masks look like they're, they're, um, but, but I think it's about fit infiltration. So the point is with a cloth, single layer cloth mask, even though you might have a tight fit, you don't have good filtration. When you have the, the, the blue masks, those are very good at filtration, um, but you may be able to figure out a way to get it even better fitting so it's on the sides, it's not, you know, you know open as much. And, um, and then if you want to do a, a, a mask and then a cloth mask, you know, the, one of those masks, but you want to get the tighter fit to be extra careful by, by putting a cloth mask over you or, or something else. I think it's very reasonable. Now, if you have something like a KN95 or an N95 respirator, there's really no reason to have anything over those. Those are the ultimate in fit and filtration, but that's really more for the medical field because we're fit tested specifically for those. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other questions by the, uh, by the committee? Yeah, I just have two quick questions and thank you doctors for being here tonight. Um, one of the questions I had was just around the variants that we hear about on a regular basis of this virus. Um, is there any concern or has there been any concern with any of the variants um, towards children or have we seen across the board that it's just been uh, that they've been more immune than others? 
maybe the pediatricians want to want to start with that. I don't know a lot about it. Um, you know, I'm not aware of any difference, Dr. McBride. I'm not sure if you if you are. Yeah, I mean, I I, I think in the variants they're just seeing that it's uh, slightly more contagious, but it doesn't seem like it's any more harmful to kids. Kind of similar morbidity and mortality rate. Right? Okay, thank you. And then the second question I had was just around the shot in general. Um, you know, it's about time that the state allowed teachers to get the shot um, starting in a couple of days. And you know, we're, we're looking at going back to school full time at the elementary level in three weeks. But you know, teachers, most teachers will probably only have one shot at that that time. Um, I'm just curious what the difference is between having that first shot um, and then getting that second shot afterwards, just in terms of, you know, if a teacher gets the shot, the first shot on the 20th, we go back to school on the 29th and then they get the second shot afterwards and just any concerns or uh, precautions that we should definitely make sure we take. There uh, does, staff. yeah, there does. I, I mean, I think it's very important to just, to just emphasize, kind of, kind of state the obvious. Johnson Johnson is a single shot right now. We are going to learn more about there's a phase three trial of the more traditional two dose Johnson Johnson vaccine. We won't have that for a while. Um, and that may or may not change certain standards, but that's irrelevant for now. J and J is one shot uh, and, and, and the Moderna and Pfizer are obviously two. That second shot is really important. It's very, very important because it, that's when you get a huge boost of the neutralizing antibodies. And those are the real antibodies that really target and don't let the virus enter the cell. So it's very important. But the good news is there's a lot of protection after one shot. And it tends to happen around day 10, roughly. Okay, so it sounds like right when school's going to open, some of you are going to be vaccinated, but some of you won't. But still, we know that and, and, and you know, when you when you talk, when you think about the pediatricians, myself, we work with we're seeing a ton of COVID positive patients. And, you know, for me, I'm, I'm often in a mask when I see patients in general. Um, I'm in an N95 when I see COVID-19 documented patients, but, you know, most of the patients I see, I'm in a mask. And so like, like teachers. So um, I think that the answer is even unvaccinated. Again, the likelihood, the biggest risk for us is getting infected when we leave the school or leave the hospital or leave our, off our clinics. That's the biggest problem. It's when we take off the mask, that's when we get infected. Thank you for that uh, explanation, Dr. Ellen. Uh, any other questions or comments from the committee? And I just want to thank again all three doctors for for being here with us tonight. Uh, we have, you know, the, the decision that's going to affect a lot of people that we're going to make uh, going forward. And uh, uh, you've helped me in my thought process uh, tremendously. And I want to thank you for that. And thank you for all your hard work. Thank you. I want to thank you guys for just all the work you're doing as, as you know, educators and stuff. I've both of my kids are school age kids and it's really, you know, we really appreciate it. I hate a lot of the stuff you hear on TV where they're pitting, you know, teachers unions and teachers and stuff. I, I just think that I love the fact that you guys are able to focus on students and do it in a safe as possible way. And I think that's what's going on here. That's what I'm hearing. You bet. Yeah, th thank you uh, again to all the uh, doctors who uh, attended this meeting and have been involved on the medical advisory committee. Any other comments you could uh, leave us with? Um, yeah, actually, can I uh, put in a plug uh, about mental health? Uh, yes. So, um, you know, th this is uh, another epidemic onto our pandemic um, and uh, kids are kids are in crisis. Um, and there's been a lot of, of course, increased rise in depression and anxiety. So for the parents on here, I wanted to just um, give them two websites uh, that they can go to. We are going to attempt to get a speaker, um, a psychiatrist that I know who's absolutely outstanding and um, spoke at a CPAC meeting recently about 
um, the trauma that's been going on and, and what we can do uh, for kids. Uh, wellmindconsulting.com is her website and on it, um, she has some really good tips uh, that are free. Um, she's got a couple of um, things that you can look at and read about what to do with your children right now. Um, and then childmind.org also has um, some really great uh, things to look at and to read so that you can have actionable items uh, for your kids who are struggling. Great, thank you. Excellent. Any other comments by our medical experts? All right, well, we thank you for your time. I appreciate the, uh, the, uh, the words that you gave us. Because ultimately for me, this is what it comes down to. We, we should take the word of the medical experts and thank you for being here to uh, demonstrate your knowledge. Thank you. Take care. And you're welcome to, you're welcome to stay on if you'd like. <laughs> All right. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand it over to Superintendent Burkhead for our, uh, I guess, our main event, which is the return to school phase two presentation. Superintendent Burkhead. Uh, thank you, Chairman Gates. And uh, I know the doctors have probably jumped off, but I, I just wanted to thank them. I think, um, like we've said, they've, they've been volunteering a lot of hours, a lot of time to uh, not many districts have this resource and, uh, you know, so I think lo locally with Dr. McBride and, and Dr. Lane, they've been outstanding. Um, not once have I uh, sat up here and spoken on behalf of our district without having their medical expertise um, in conversations with them. So the, the science is real. Um, Dr. Ellerin, Ellerin um, you know, a professional in the field of infectious diseases to for him to volunteer to come and speak with us, I think is powerful. Your questions were excellent. So thank you. and, and um, and very important for everyone here. So I'll continue with the rest of the presentation. Um, Great. Okay. So just more medical evidence. I know I get a lot of feedback and I know you have that, well, with a lot of questions about the science and uh, I know Desi um, has, uh, their, their uh, Credibility has wavered a little bit, but this was a letter I just want to include in your packets and it'll be part of this presentation for people to look at. It's signed by over by 65 infectious disease physicians, pediatricians and public health experts. They wrote the letter to uh, Commissioner Riley on the, similar to the conversations you heard tonight from our doctors, just supporting the return to in-person learning. Um, and so that's for your records. I won't read it tonight, but I'll, I think it's up to over a hundred uh, doctors have signed off on it in counting. So I, I just wanted to give more medical evidence that it's it's not just the three doctors we had tonight, We're not cherry picking doctors. These doctors have been with us um, locally, Dr. Lane, Dr. McBride, and Dr. Um, Ellerin has been speaking on this. Um, you know, that's his career. But these letters also reinforce that to hopefully make people at ease that uh, the science has shifted and that it is um, with the mitigation strategies, obviously, um, becoming more and more safe to bring students back to in-person learning. Just to review, you've seen this a lot. You know, we're looking, we're in the orange, we're looking to go to the yellow. I mean, technically, if you look at green, it says vaccine or cure. Um, you know, although we have the vaccine, I think we're far away from a, a, a cure. I may be wrong, but uh, so I think the yellow is safe. And I want to just emphasize that the three feet is the bit, is the minimum. I think it's more likely in the upper grades than the elementary. And I'll show some examples of what classrooms look like that I think the majority are at four to five feet even uh, in some of the smaller classes. So I think three is the, the minimum we would ever go. And I think the DESE guidelines are seat to seat. I know, I think Chairman Gates, you asked the question on how do we do that? We measure from middle of the seat to middle of the seat. So it is technically from the person to the person on where they'd be sitting to have the most realistic measurement is a summary of what we've shared before, uh, phase one. Um, I wanna give a shout out to, uh, to Rosie for sharing that anecdotal, anecdotal evidence of uh, what kids are talking about. I think I've heard that from the administrators and from our, our educators as well and staff. Um, that Wednesday went extremely well, and from parents. Um, I think we got an overwhelming amount of positive feedback and I, I don't re recall uh, many negatives at all, quite honestly. So, and I wanna make that, I want to emphasize that because I think 
um, the process we used to get to Wednesdays was very thorough, measured, um, and purposeful. Similarly to how we're doing phase two and how I would recommend we do phase three, uh, that we don't necessarily have to be the first school to beat everyone to this. We have to be the smartest. And you had an example tonight of uh, involving medical experts, um, using the research, involving our community in transparency and inclusiveness with our safe and strong 80 person representative group to offer feedback at each of the phases, uh, to have surveys for our community, students and staff to offer feedback and it's working. Um, so uh, the Wednesdays is an example. It was very well prepared and organized and you know, a phase within a phase, if you will. Uh, after the presentations here, the hard work begins on the ground with our, our, our principals working with their staffs, rolling up their sleeves and collaborating. And I know Dr. Eleanor mentioned this, but I just want to emphasize that this, um, that this is a unified administration and teachers uh, working together to make these plans happen. Um, you know, we mentioned the word negotiations and I think people think the worst that it's, okay, it's gonna be held up for some reason. Um, it hasn't been the case. It's been very collaborative, very positive. And, and the whole reason for that is just to make sure that everyone's safe. And uh, so we're working right along with that. Phase two is on the proposal tonight. I shared at the Safe and Strong Committee last week, I had an asterisk next to that 29 because I just wanted to make sure that we could have the buildings ready. We've been doing similar to what we've done in, in the fall for preparation for our return. We've had Rise um, Company in to look at our airflow and, and make sure, and Dr. Eleanor mentioned this, that that's as important as uh, the distancing. So we're very confident now uh, that all our schools will be ready and, and safe uh, with the airflow by March 29th in the elementaries. And then uh, I've added a new target date because I think that's important that as we move into phase two that we have phase three ready to go. And again, that planning is daily. Um, it's not just happening. The date is new because we are confident with, again, the steps we've taken that we believe we can bring the six through 12 students back safely by April 12th all in. Just some considerations for phase two that we're talking about for a vote tonight. Um, last Friday, uh, the commissioner had a, the Board of Education gave the commissioner authority to um, return students K through five back in full person learning by April 5th. His guidance will be coming out, I believe this week. So that's on the horizon, which means, you know, to me, it's inevitable that these, this is happening. And um, so based on all their science and evidence, that's the way they're going. I think that's important to know. K through five, obviously, is our focus in phase two. Um, and again, we talked about these last points um, and the reasons why, so I won't read them all to you, but um, that's the reason why we started with K through five. We now have an updated document here, again, with our transparency. The last slide I had was um, February 18th, I believe, for the February 22nd meeting. Now we're in March, uh, so we updated through March 1st here. Again, you see the numbers um, are what they are, but they're definitely lower at the elementaries. And um, I thought that was important. And then uh, again, we haven't had any confirmation that there's been any tr spread in school. And most of the cases we've ruled that out completely. And I just wanna give an example on that because some people debate that. Well, how do you really know? Um, so for example, our contract tracing is pretty, pretty substantial, pretty involved. We work with our great Board of Health and I wanna give them a shout out as well. Um, Mr. Shealy and um, over there at the, at the Board of Health and, and Eileen, they've done a great job, part of our MAC crew as well. And, um, you know, we do the contact tracing, our nurses dig deep and find out. We, we, we use our principals and call our parents. And so in the example, a lot of the examples like Dr. Eller and said are happening outside of school. So for example, a parent may get it at work now that they know they've got it, they communicate that with the school, they keep their children home um, quarantining. Next thing you know, the children get it. So there's two cases because there's two kids in the family. We've had cases of four kids in the family get it. So keep in mind that these numbers aren't all just independent families. Some of these are, are uh, compounded into a family unit. Um, so we know that that case, those two, in this example, those two children got it from their parent at home and they've been home quarantining. So they haven't had uh, in school contact. 
So we're able to rule them out. So that's just an example of how we dig and find out the, the lack of transmission in schools. Here's just a visual of it. This is our um, trends up the three one again, continuing to go down a little bump here, but written then right back down. So this is back in the winter when we had to shut down the high point here. And then uh, it turned out to be a smart move because then things started going down considerably. And thought it was important. This is new to uh, this presentation. Uh, it mirrors what the town is going through right now. You know, we talk about the CDC, CDC ties, uh, you know, town and community spread uh, as a factor to consider. And so we wanted to include that here. And um, again, numbers are going way down, which is a credit to the community. And it mirrors what's happening in our schools. So now we get into the survey results. Again, we want to get people's input before we present it and um, finalize decisions and educate the school committee as best we can. So you make this decision uh, easier. So the parent survey have given a choice regarding schooling in March or April through the end of the school year. Uh, that should be three to six feet of social distancing. Uh, what will you choice, choose for your students? Uh, really good turnout here, 1160 respondents. And uh, the number um, that are uh, feel comfortable with that is up close to 90%. Um, then some summaries on the open responses. Uh, return the kids to school, 167, no concerns, 101. I'll let you read the rest. They go down um, from there. Uh, we have talked about some folks that said, you know, why don't we stay in the hybrid model? It, you know, we've got 51 parents that feel that way. You know, I have been clear that we can't do both full in person and in hybrid, but we will honor the remote, full remote, as will as the uh, commissioner of education has also committed to. So, uh, you know, the the hybrid will end once this starts, and uh, we will have a, a document that goes out that people can make a decision based on the information from tonight, which is more than we had last presentation, um, to to come fully in or to go fully remote. Um, and so these are just some more feedback from parents, obviously very helpful, you know, six feet preferred. I think obviously we'll, we'll, we all prefer that. We'll do that when feasible social emotional. We talked a little bit about with Dr. McBride tonight. We're very well aware of that. And I think that's, that's aided by having kids in front of us in person. So I think that'll be helped there. And I think our numbers will improve as kids return to school. Um, this is a staff survey. Their major Areas of concern were vaccinations and planning time. And so we're addressing that as we communicate and work with our staff. Uh, the vaccinations um, have, are coming to fruition, which is a great development. And with those considerations, the comfort level with the vaccine is approximately 80%. Uh, student survey, grades five through 12. Um, Basically the summary on the left of the question is when we are able to return in person, um, we, we emphasize that we're still gonna be wearing masks uh, on the bus and in the building and keeping our phys physical distance, um, hand washing, sanitizing, cleaning the building. So all our mitigation strategies, basically all that considered, how comfortable do you feel returning to school between three and six feet? And as you can see the numbers there, um, almost uh, out of the 700 and um, over 700 that uh, took the survey, close to 425 uh, were either comfortable or extremely comfortable. And then neutral, 137. And then these are the folks, these are the kiddos that obviously will, um, that are concerned that that comes into our transition planning um, and identifying who those students are, but also identifying uh, the smoothest uh, and safest transition uh, physically and, and social emotionally for all our students, uh, knowing that this, this population exists, that there is anxiety out there for a return to school. And that's very normal. Our default would be that we assume all kids might be that way. And then uh, we thought this was a, a very interesting one and um, the kids filled this out and why the numbers might not add up to the 700 and so you saw in the previous slide because students were able to pick uh, five. So they there was more than one choice they could pick. Just some interesting stuff here. Um, they missed lunch with their friends the most. You know, that was pretty resounding. 
uh, and interesting, the social piece, uh, obvious to, to us now. Um, electives are important, returning to structured school, missed their teachers, which was awesome to see uh, in projects. So this is very helpful to us as we plan the return and how we uh, keep kids excited about returning to school when they do. Um, now some areas of concern for the kids and <laughs> stress from uh, changing models. Uh, whoops, is important all the way down to the lunch safety and changing classes. So this is all information that's been very helpful in our planning to return the students. So we'll use that in, um, you know, for example, wearing a mask all day, that's come up a lot for all kids and for the staff, it's a long day. Please know that we're making um, all kinds of effort in breaking the day up, including outside breaks, obviously, splitting the class in half if we have to, to get half the class go outside, the other class can stretch out inside, then switch those groups. So there's a lot of planning that goes along with this. And I, I appreciate everyone's patience, but I, I just wanted to give that example of simply how do we get through a six and a half hour day wearing masks? Because that could be very uncomfortable. So stuff that we typically don't plan for when we return to school, like how are we gonna break up the day for students and staff so that it's bearable and that we can get mask breaks uh, and strategically do so and keeping classes separate from each other and kids not clumping together is all very strategic and needs to be planned and that's what we're doing. So that's why we need the time in between uh, phases to get this all done and to do it right the first time. Here's the feedback from our Safe and Strong uh, Task Force. I wanna thank all the members there that are committed. That work will be ongoing. And it's just been a great group of people with um, a lot of outstanding input. So I'll let you read these. But uh, the first one we asked about, how can the community help? Dr. Ellerin nailed it when he said, the, the spread that we're seeing is happening outside of school. I often get emails about, you know, people are going skiing and people are leaving the state, not telling anyone. You know, I'm not gonna micromanage people's homes, but we wanted to ask that question to say, how can the schools educate and keep people motivated to mitigate while outside of school? And here are some examples so we can be partners in, in keeping our kids and staff safe in the buildings. So you'll see here, you know, sharing as much information about facts and details as we can is a good one. Um, publish uh, information about vaccines, obviously keep current safety measures, um, and then learning plans for quarantine students. And the medical advisory committee obviously will be intact uh, throughout this year. And I, I likely think that would be the case moving into next year. It's been a really good resource for us. Um, the next question we talked about, and again, this whole meeting was focused on solutions. You know, we know what the issues are and the challenges. We, we thought it was important to get the collective brain power to talk about solutions as we bring students back to school. So how can we help with the social, emotional and mental health in school and at home? Obviously um, here, the adults will set the tone and model what we expect from our students, both at home and in school. Um, maintain safety protocols, absolutely. Relationships here, giving students a voice. Uh, we saw that with this survey um, and continued uh, groups within the schools to offer feedback. Transparency has been a commitment all year. We'll continue to do that. And um, direct instruction of social emotional skills. So we are prepared for that. We have been pre preparing for that and it will be part of our educational curriculum moving forward. Um, and then the reimagine, this is kind of getting into uh, learning from what we have and taking some of the positives away from the hybrid and remote models. And how can we use that to improve our educational models moving forward? As I mentioned before, education will never be the same. Not necessarily a bad thing. I look at it as a, as a really good thing that it's only gonna get better from what we've learned. And um, some of the things we, we've been collecting is data on um, gaps in learning, both academically and social emotionally and planning for addressing that. Um, Ms. Rundle presented tonight with the students. She'll be back in April to share some of that data and some of the things we're doing to address social emotional um, learning at our schools. So we look forward to that. Focusing on the whole child, absolutely critical. 
the relationship piece we saw in documents earlier is important, just as important as the academic piece. And I think we can do both well. Communication with families needs to be um, at the center of what we do. Small class sizes um, obviously is the ideal. And summer programs, including course, uh, looking at how we can support our students through um, the rest of the year and into the fall. And then summer work uh, to adapt curriculum is also important as we pre prepare for the fall. So very good feedback there. Um, I get a lot of emails and correspondence that the Joneses are doing this and, and our neighboring schools are doing this. Why aren't we doing this? And uh, so I just wanted to, you know, I, I got this information and I just wanted to put things in perspective that because the state has no one plan and one size fits all, it's very localized and every district's different. But just because you hear a, a, a K through five is back at one school, it doesn't mean they're, it's the same here. So I wanted to just point this out with stuff. And I think we're you know, in the ballpark with all of these schools. And for example, um, and again, this, this could change daily. These plans were given to me and, and like our plans, they evolve and change. So this is the most recent data I had. And uh, you know, initially I think when Cohasset returned, they had everyone at six feet. So they were able to do that because they had more space. Now they're at six to, uh, three to six feet. They started early March, okay? Um, and they're looking April 5th. I gave our data as 12th. We're right in the ballpark with them and that's tentative. Okay, so that's there. Duxbury, they brought into uh, kids in the phases. And again, right around April 5th. But you notice over here, it's four days. Uh, our proposal would be, uh, and, and what I've seen with some of the high schools is they're not serving lunch. Um, so they're using modified schedules. Some of the schools are going, sending the kids home at like noon or one o'clock and they're eating at home and having a remote class maybe in the afternoon. So it's, um, so when people hear it, they say, okay, they're back in person full, not necessarily. And I think our proposal, again, we wanna do it once. We don't wanna keep changing models. So we wanna bring everybody in full time, full days with lunch. And so that's, the reason why ours be, might be taking a little longer um, in all the facts. Uh, Hanover uh, went back, I think was one of the earliest schools to go back. So we're getting some good information from them. Uh, Hingham, again, right around our time, they're looking to go mid-March and then the 17th, six to eight. Uh, oh, sorry. All right. And then uh, alternating, they're, they're alternating, alternating their Wednesdays, but they, uh, they dismiss at lunch, All right? So a little, little different again, our model is looking to, um, and their nine through 12 is TBD, all right? Marshfield uh, brought their K through five kids back and, and speaking with uh, in, in superintendent there, who's a situate resident, that's going extremely well. And actually all the superintendents that have their K through fives back have no, has seen no increase in, uh, in community spread or school spread. So uh, anecdotal information for you there. So they're, again, they're four days a week with K through five and six through 12 is TBD. Norwell, March 29th, right on target with where we're looking at. Uh, Pembroke, um, 16th and the 30th of March for their upper grades. Silver Lake, um, you know, which is part of the, the, the uh, this group here too is nine through 12, right on the same date as us. Again, dismissing at lunch, so a little different. And Whitman Hansen is April 12th, so later further their elementary, but a week earlier than I'm suggesting for us. us. So just a summary, the, the grass isn't always greener. Not everybody's back already. Not everybody's back with the same model. Not everybody's back full day. Um, everyone's doing it a little differently. So I just wanted to clear the air on that, make sure that everyone knew uh, what those particulars were. And again, that information is subject to change um, depending on what each school committee is doing and what each superintendent is doing at the school district. I wanted to include in this presentation, uh, transportation information, because that's been updated by DESE guide, guidance. Uh, we're allowed to now have 49 students per bus. When we move to this model, we will be uh, combining A and B. We're going to, uh, very important, we're, we're going to keep the same routes to be as similar as possible, maybe some slight changes if necessary. But the goal here is to keep the same routes. 
Um, it's important for parents to know if you're taking the bus that there'll be increased capacity on those buses and there'll be assigned seats and siblings will sit together. Same cleaning protocols, um, windows will be open. Um, as Dr. Ellern said, even a, a slight crack in the window is very helpful for airflow and parents will have this bus information. Uh, uh, you know, pending a positive vote tonight, I'll be sending out a, a document by the end of the week, kind of asking folks where they, if they're planning on sending their students back full-time or remote, and if they will be planning on using the bus. So we'll have those numbers and we'll be able to get that information out. Again, another piece of the pie to organize, uh, bus routes, uh, more kids, seating charts, all this stuff takes time and, and care to do it right. So I just wanted to share the another example of practical on the ground stuff that we have to do to make sure this is done right. Um, and then facilities, obviously an important one. Um, and we're making sure that all buildings meet at least minimum airflow requirements. And that'll be, um, we, we are able to do that. And then students will be at least three feet apart. And again, a lot of cases more, that's the minimum. Uh, I know we talked about teachers at six feet. And I know uh, any, any educator would, would say, obviously that, you know, you can't stay six feet apart all the time. You're going to walk by kids. You're going to hand out stuff, and especially the young, younger kids, uh, help them pick something up. We get that. I think the doctors answered that uh, rather well tonight. Uh, I think it's a cumulative time of being under three feet and, and, and having your mask on or not having your mask on. So um, although the education might change a little to do that, it's doable. Um, cleaning protocols um, and sanitation will obviously continue and we're highly focused on how that might change. And we've got plenty of PPE for our staff and our students. So visuals helped uh, when we did this in the fall. So we just wanted to give everybody a kind of a, a visual perspective of what it might look like. There's, uh, you know, this is third grade at Cushing on the right and then fifth grade up top here with 18 desks. As you can see, I, you know, I think this is more closer to four feet on this, this slide. Um, and up the front, you can see we try to keep a runway with the teacher here to have that path of six feet um, over in this entire section here to um, teach the class. Here's an example of Hatherley. And this grade on the left is 21 desks. That's, I think our max is 22. Um, so again, a good distance apart. Um, here's the cafeteria. That's a good shot of what lunch would look like at six feet. Um, and again, uh, what we found with the kids now at six feeding lunch that um, they can still have conversations and um, interact with the people in their general area. And, and that's been helpful. And we also saw from our student survey that lunch is very important to the kids. So we're working hard on making that happen. Here's Jenkins School, uh, fourth grade on the left, first grade, both 17 desks, different vantage points there. And then Wampatuck, 20 desks on this one. Again, good distance apart. We're able to do it. We've um, looked at all of our classrooms. Again, part of the legwork for the principals and custodial team and the staff is um, getting each room set up because there, there's different sizes. Um, and I think one of the ideas that staff came up with, which I thought was a good one, was we'll do the measurements and then we'll come up with a room capacity to. Um, make sure that people feel safe that, okay, this room is uh, this size so we can fit safely X amount of people in this room. And so we don't, we make sure that we don't go over that number to keep everyone safe. So here's the timeline similar to what we used that was effective in our Wednesday planning. And as you heard the feedback, and I think it's, it's true for our task force conversations as well, because I didn't put those Wednesday conversations in that feedback, but it was very positive. Um, and I won't go through every detail, but you see a, a pattern here. We involve the, uh, we have a draft of what it might look like. We have feedback on the draft. We present the school committee. We have our safe and strong way in. We have our steering committee kind of put the meat on the bone from all that information, collect it, and then bring it back to the school committee in a, a refined version, um, as we're doing here tonight. Negotiations with our, our unions are ongoing to put the details in how it can be operational and safe. 
And then um, in this model, if this was approved tonight, what worked for our Wednesdays very well, and it's created a, a you know a collaborative atmosphere is sharing example schedules, uh, measuring out the rooms, and then rolling up our sleeves with the administrators and teachers and making sure that everything is, you know, can be implemented uh, and, and done so safely. So that's kind of the brass tacks where this all comes together. So we make sure we provide ample time for that to all work out and conversations are already happening. Um, and then once that's all done and we're, we're confident that, okay, everyone's ready to go, we have this, we can imp implement this. Here's the schedule, here's what the rooms look like. Let's get this out to families. That's what we did with Wednesdays. That would follow the same protocol in this case with the effective time to begin on the 29th. Um, I just want to go back there, sorry. And then phase three, I put down here, um, again, full days. You've noticed on a lot of the other plans in the other districts, they are not tech necessarily all back full day. Um, I think that's a commitment we'd like to make because uh, lunch would be the tough part. And again, logistically, that's going to take some time. So phase three, our recommendation is uh, target would be April 12th and, um, you know, in line with what other districts are doing. But that, you know, again, I, I don't put a lot of stock in that because we've done it our own way and it's all localized. And I think every di school district has done a good job fitting the needs of their community. Um, but I've also given you some examples purposely tonight on how this process has worked on this, this slide right here. I think the same needs to be done for phase three. And that's been taking about, you know, a month to do and do well. Um, so I think we should we should stick to that. So that's where the date comes from. Also April 12th, I think the 13th, the next day, the quarter four starts the high school. So that's a good time to transition back to full in-person learning. But there's a lot, um, a lot of logistical stuff that has to happen at the secondary level with a lot more moving parts than the elementary. Again, we've been meeting on it, but everything from, um, you know, purchasing new, new um, desks for the uh, Gates Middle School because they have tables. It was built for a project-based learning. And I think they're all about five and a half feet wide. So we can only fit one per table. So we have to bring in the number of desks. So we have to order them, purchase them, install them, um, you know, parking for the kids, uh, drop off, pickup, schedules. I mean, I was a high school assistant principal and principal and doing schedules took, takes six months to do a, a high school schedule. And now we're we're asking these uh, our team to do so. Uh, they did the Wednesday schedule and now they've got to do another one. So to do it right, and then the example I would give you is for example, at the middle of high school, if you have 28 students in your uh, math class and you're in a classroom uh, that's measured out at uh, three to four feet, you can only fit 20. Well, the scheduler has to find a different room for you to safely go. And let's say at the high school, that's the pack. Okay, so now it's a, pu a puzzle pieces move. We have to move that math class into the pack that period to safely fit everybody. All right, well, who was in the pack during that time? Do they, are they displaced? And if we're eating lunch and we're using the gyms to, to make sure we have six feet, where are the wellness classes gonna go? If they go outside, that's great, but on a rainy day, we have to find a home for them. So all of these logistical things uh, need to happen and to do it, like I said, right the first time, so this will be our last change, we need this time to do it and to do it right. And that's why, uh, and also along with, if we wanna do it, how we've done it here, where I come back on the 22nd with a more detailed approach, specifically to secondary level, um, input from our safe and strong task force, input from our medical advisory committee, using the feedback from our recent survey. Um, I think that, gives the school committee ample time to make a decision on that vote uh, and us time to prepare and to work with our uh, staffs to make it happen. And um, I feel confident we could do that. That concludes my presentation for this evening. Great, thank you, Superintendent Burkett. I think that um, it's a great presentation. I think that one that we've been looking at obviously for a while, as well as the other, was 330 participants here today. Um, thank you for the detail, the well thought out uh, comments, um, survey results and that sort of thing. Um, what I'd like to do at this point is I'm gonna open up to the committee for their questions or comments. Um, and then I will open it up to the public.
public for their comments before we vote. Um, but at this point, I'd like to open up to the school committee for any comments or questions. I have a few, Pete. Uh, Mr. Hayes. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Bill, um, and the task force and, and, and everyone involved in this. And, and uh, it's, it's really gratifying that we are doing it the way Situate Public Schools believes is best for our, our kids and our, our students. Um, a couple of comments first. Um, I think it's important for for everyone on the committee and everyone watching and, and listening and, and, and all parents and kids is that this pandemic is still a huge problem. Uh, I mean, we're at levels now that we were at basically last summer and uh, uh, Last summer, everyone was extremely concerned, uh, but we're at 60,000 cases a day, 2,000 deaths a day, hospitalizations are down, yes, uh, but this pandemic is still going strong. Um, so I just, I wanted to make that point because, uh, you know, I, I, you hear medical experts all the time say this is no time to relax and it's no time to first of all uh i'm i'm in favor of opening up the elementary schools uh as you presented. Um, I had one question on the uh, medical, on the uh, elementary schools was, um, where are the kids gonna eat lunch? The cafeteria, the gym. And uh, do you, ha wh is that enough? What will the spacing be in during lunch? Yeah, six feet. We're committed to six feet at all the schools. We've measured it out, we can do it. We've had to purchase again, portable um, individual tables for the students to eat at. So okay. the old uh, long tables that you saw at works at one school might not work at another. So we've made adjustments to um, order those where needed uh, yeah. to make sure that students can be six feet apart when they eat. Great, I, yeah. And uh, you know, also just as a comment, I mean, I wanna, uh, I've talked to I have family in Hingham and I have family in, in Pembroke and, and the information I think is, is uh, I'm not sure if it's 100% right because um, uh, I believe uh, uh, that Hingham has yet to, uh, to um, decide what they're gonna do for um, other than elementary. And I know uh, Pembroke has no plans to go five days a week yet at any point during the during the school year so um but again i mean i just bring that up uh just so that we have all our information correct so maybe we could double check things as we go forward um so again i i am in favor of of opening up pre-k through five uh full time um i must say however uh I'm a, I'm a long, long way away from doing the same for grades six through 12. And uh, I think when it comes time to vote, I, I would recommend that uh, the school committee approve I think we lost your audio. Mike. I didn't catch what he said. We're yeah, approve. We're a long That's way away from uh, phase three, in my opinion. Okay. All right. Uh, other comments by the committee? I have comments. Ms. Um, Brandolini. Yeah, I kind of just wrote my comments out, um, and I think they may sound redundant at this point from our medical experts and Mr. Burkhead's presentation, but I will read them anyway, since 
Um, I wrote them. Um, so as everybody knows, we get uh, our school committee gets emails through our Mass Association of School Committees um, group. And I, I don't want to speak for the rest of you all, but um, the five of us, but I find them really great and helpful, but also overwhelming because it is a big group. So I try to catch what I can. And, and sometimes it, I mean, it's just such a good practice to have that uh, you know, view of what's going on around the state with other towns and cities and see what they're dealing with. Um, so one email that struck me recently was from a gentleman named Peter Demling. He was from Amherst Pelham. Um, he's my new friend. And so I had reached out to him and just, I felt like some of the pieces that he wrote kind of um, were swirling around in my head, but the way he delivered, I was like, okay, that's kind of where I want to go. So I wanted to credit him for some of the basis of what I wrote, because um, much of it is from his original thought process, but I obviously made it for Situate. Um, so with the novelty of COVID and the vast differences among districts across the state, I believe what we should do and have been doing is keep operating through the guiding principles put in place in collaboration with medical professionals, SPS administration, parents and students. There's so much information available and it is ever changing. As a mom of four and a school counselor, I've learned to always assume there is more than one truth to every story and to recognize that everyone is operating through their own lenses and for their own self-preservation and their own best interest of loved ones and family. Everyone has a reason for why we feel as the way we do about any topic and COVID is certainly no exception. I cannot possibly judge any individual decisions from afar without the benefit of the full context of your situation. Currently, I feel three feet distancing is situate right now is safe given our current level of community spread, quality of ventilation, testing protocols, the ambitious endeavors taken on in the past week by our staff and faculty to secure vaccine appointments. Uh, and of course, the recommendations of our local public health officials. I want to also recognize the privilege we have to be able to check those boxes above for our children and their teachers, because for some cities and towns right now, given the variability of those and many other conditions, they cannot confidently make, confidently make these decisions. I don't walk in their shoes and I won't judge their positions. Uh, we have received so many passionate and thoughtful emails about COVID this entire year, almost practically to the date. Uh, Many include the phrase, do the right thing for our children. But then depending on the email, the context ranges from staying in hybrid through June to bringing everyone back in PK to 12 tomorrow. Whatever your personal feeling is right now, the science is evolving. We have far, excuse me, we have far more research to rely on than we did last summer. It is incredibly sad, however, that political leaders and dominant voices on social media have created and enabled such a hostile environment for meaningful and open-minded dialogue, forcing us to continually fight against the momentum of our own confirmation bias in order to have a chance at evolving our personal understanding, to take advantage of new information in a thoughtful way and change, thereby making more informed and responsible decisions for the students of our district. Vaccine levels are increasing, our community spread numbers are very low, but anxiety and depression are high. Students need greater access to in-school supports and services. That said, given Situate's current data, I think we would be negligent if we did not vote yes to full in-person learning. To make the clearest decisions, we have to be open to change. That means resisting the constant politics and intense social media forces that pressure us to polarize into fixed positions and supporting each other as we wade through the challenges of a pandemic. This is how we can best serve the children of Situate. Let's model that for them. Excellent, Ms. Brinley, that was, that was excellent. I'm glad that you used the example uh, from Peter Dem. Uh, yes, I'm gonna give him credit for it. Yeah, but he, 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 he's a usual responder to that list, but he's a very yes. healthy and smart guy. So thank you for taking time to do that. I, I mean, Personally, that reflects basically how I feel as well, but I'm going to, I'm going to allow the rest of the committee to, uh, to opine and comment um, before I make any additional statements. Um, anyone else? Ms. Lindblom. Um, yeah, I think, Nicole, that was a fantastic statement. And I, I, I agree, you know, it echoes my feelings towards this and um, especially the emails because, yeah, I mean, we, 
no matter what we decide, not everybody's going to be happy. And, you know, looking at the pictures of how the classrooms were set up, I mean, I do feel like a twinge of anxiety, but you have to, you have to tell yourself, like, you have to listen to the science. You have to, you know, believe in the science that is telling us that it is safe for the kids to go back at those distances, even though it's, you know, they're not all three feet, but it's not six feet. And the science is telling us that the kids will be safe. They'll be okay when we have all the other precautions in place, like the masking and the hand washing. Um, I do have a couple of questions for, for Bill about the presentation and just, um, um, so do, depending, according to the, uh, the I, I can't, lost my, um, my train of thought, the surveys that you sent out, do you foresee an increase in cohort C students? Um, no, actually, um, we've seen a huge decline in cohort C students, um, I'm looking for the numbers today because I- Like in relation to like, if we, you know, when you, we have give the two options, do you think that students will, you know, so you're saying that like, you, you don't think that that cohort will increase? No, I don't. In fact, I think over the last few weeks, and I know there's a bunch of our elementary principals here, um, they've, they're, they're, they've been having uh, the opposite effect. Now that the momentum is going, vaccinations are out, our plans have been shared, more information is out there. Um, a lot of the remote C students have moved back at the elementary to full or to what we have now into the hybrid. Um, the estimated numbers I have right now are that currently in K through five here, there's uh, two first graders, 13 second graders, 23rd graders, 13 fourth graders, and uh, only 15 fifth graders. Um, and so those, those numbers fluctuate from day to day if somebody comes back, but, um, you know, I guess that's part A is that momentum is all, to, all coming back now, not going the opposite direction. Um, but I do, I do suspect that there will be people that may make the choice that, um, we're comfortable with hybrid, that they're not comfortable maybe with all in and they may go remote, mm -hmm. uh, with the flexibility, however, of coming back to full in person. So, you know. We'll have to wait and see, but I, I, I think what the momentum and the numbers are showing us now is more families are choosing the opposite to come back fully in person. Okay, and um, if we, so say, you know, in a few weeks, kids uh, K to five are full in person and in the community, we see an increase or a spike in cases. We don't have, we're not gonna be doing like say go to hybrid. It would be full in person or fully remote at this point. That's correct. Okay. And do you also foresee possibly um, bus stops or bus uh, children's might, kids might be like say bumped from one bus to another if depending on, uh, you know, the number of kids going on a bus, like say there's, you know, we're gonna be having more kids on the bus. Well, we have to move one kid to a different bus. I'll let uh, Dr. Dutch kind of fill in the blanks here, but it's my understanding that that's unlikely to happen, that we're going to be able to keep our same routes with okay. the numbers we have. Um, Bob, is that accurate? Or could there could be a possibility for some kids to change buses? Is that accurate? Uh, <clears throat> it's accurate that it's unlikely that they'll need to change buses. Um, given mm -hmm. the number of students in cohort A and cohort B, currently simply combining them gives us a little bit of space on each bus right now. Um, at the elementary level. Mm -hmm. So even with some additional students deciding to uh, take transportation, we should be able to keep kids on the same bus that they're on currently. Uh, okay. So that, that's the plan, but that's the reason we need people to sign, you know, let us know if they're going to be taking transportation. Yeah, I mean, it wouldn't be the first time a bus route changed. <laughs> so. No, the, the routes may change a little bit. Um, you know, they may start five minutes earlier and five minutes later, but um, the, the general route will be pretty consistent. Okay, and Bill, the, the graphs that you used that you showed us for the town and the school um, cases, do they, does the, the town include our uh, student numbers in that? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you, Ms. Lindblom. Uh, Mr. Long. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Gates. Uh, Superintendent Burke, I thank you for putting this information together and having the, the medical, um, the, the doctors come into tonight's meeting. I think that was a very powerful message that we were able to get across to the community. And I, I texted you how important that it would be to get that out, but I got a number of texts just in terms of how, how much that helped a number of parents as they watched that um, go through. Um, I think a lot of what I was going to say was actually been covered, so I'll try not to be too redundant. But I think one of the biggest things that you brought up about breaking up the day um, is important. We found, and, I mean, Dr. McBride talked about the social emotional wellness, which is obviously very important for our students and staff. But um, and that's, that's come up from from both sides in previous meetings, but also um, you know trying to find ways without losing time on learning to have that that one on one time that I know teachers have said they've been able to get. Um, through the, the hybrid model, but just keeping that moving forward so that as we do come back, um, you know, all of our students are continuing to move forward and not losing um, any any forward momentum as we get towards the end of the year and not getting to a point that we're not, you know, we're starting to fall behind um, just in terms of the curriculum or, you know, having a student feel like they're not prepared for the next, uh, for the next year. Um, and the only other point that I was going to bring up, and, and I know, you know, the last safe and strong task force with a lot of coming coming together to find solutioning, which is as we go through uh, looking at the concerns and finding those finding those solutions, just making sure we share that out to know with the community to know, you know, we had concerns with this this class size. So this is what we did to make it work at mm -hmm. this school versus that school. So that you know, just so that it's well shared and, and well known that so the families are aware of um, how we're addressing some of these concerns that that either teachers or students are bringing up. But um, you know what you've been able to share over the past couple months and what we've heard from the medical advisory committee makes me feel very very comfortable voting tonight and i agree with mr hayes that you know moving forward with phase two is going to be very beneficial for our our students uh, thank you mr long and i think that was the the intent of bringing the doctors on tonight was um you know to, to put people at ease that um and answer your questions and that you know to get there and instead of hearing it from me hearing it directly from them. And so, again, that was the intent to get your, their, your questions answered. And um, hopefully, um, I agree with you, we'll, we'll get that information out so that folks that weren't able to make it tonight can can hear them. And uh, the good news is we have access to, obviously, the two local doctors uh, weekly we meet, so or, or sometimes daily, depending on what the need is. So they've been wonderful. And now that we've got a, a new friend in Dr. Ellerin, uh, thanks to uh, Kelly Roach, I think we can reach out to him as needed as well. So we've got some good uh, resources here, certainly. Great, thank you. Ms. Long, you all, is that you good? Yep, I'm all set, thanks. All right. Um, can I just add one thing, Peter? Yes, before you Before you go to public comment. Um, just wanted to say that I feel like our elementary model that was developed through Safe and Strong and you know Mr. Burkhead's model was so great in terms of just smart and safe and by eliminating lunch and you know places of stronger potential for spread especially way back when this was being first developed in July and August it was so smart to do that and, and genius in a way I mean so many districts went with the same model as our secondary with the Monday Tuesday and then be on Thursday Friday and I think ours was smart in that way but now transitioning for these elementary kids is a different, you know, this might be a negative to that model because now we're asking them to do that six stretch hour in masks that they haven't had to do, even though I think we absolutely did the right model. This is the challenge. But I was thinking too, um, as we're looking to transition to this type of model, I mean, all in obviously, but um, other towns, you know, have done, like for me personally at work, we've done we did the, the same model as our secondary. So like our elementary kids are, were used to that stretch of a day and used to having specials and lunch in the building. Obviously things change, but I feel like Situate doesn't know. We Those, like my kindergartners never eaten lunch in the building. So this is like a whole brand new, she's beyond excited about this, but it's a new thing. So I'm just curious, like they're looking at other districts who have had that other model what has worked for them to get the kids like you know what protocols have they put in place that they're keeping as they move to full in person that have helped with that full long day model could be beneficial trust going forward like you know 
for example, like we, we, our kids have lunch like 50, 50. So cohort A is going to eat in the classroom and B will go to the cafeteria. So you're still having eight or nine kids in the classroom at six, seven feet apart. And then the same amount in the cafeteria. So like, that's something that got teased out over the months, like, whoa, this didn't work. This worked in those other schools that maybe, um, you know, we could pick and choose. Like, I don't know if other superintendents have you know, this is what was a great idea. And this was a not great idea back in September, but maybe that'd be helpful as you kind of tease out how to approach the elementary, you know, details. Yeah, thank you. I, I completely agree. I think uh, we're all in these group networks, I think that we talked about, which has been really helpful. You know, I've got the superintendent group, the principals got their each their group at their own levels, really been a wealth of information resources. And, you know, just hearing how, you know, I know you, you and I had talked about that, uh, about how splitting the class up and, and breaking that up a little bit. One group goes outside, one group stays in. Those are all helpful. And one of the advantages of not going first is to get some of these good ideas and use yeah. them uh, so that we do it right the first time. So I agree with you. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. And I think, like you said, there's no perfect solution to any of it. And there's no, because no. because we're all left to our own discretion and district levels to figure this out, you know, it is a little bit of a you know, there's no one perfect model that we're all, we all should aspire to be like, well, just kind of picking pieces and learning as we go still. But um, I really do think Situate has an, a really great team and a great approach. And I'm thankful for everybody who has been working so hard on it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll just wrap it. I don't want to be redundant of all the same comments that are questions of the prior members. I just some very small details, Superintendent Burkett or Dr. Dutch. Um, I found it interesting that I think that Hadley had the lowest case rate. I know it's probably the smallest school in attendance, but I know that there had been concerns about the ventilation. So obviously the ventilation there has been addressed and working. With that being said, the, um, the doctors also mentioned, and, and it's been brought up that opening windows uh, is helpful. Do you know, you know, what schools do not have windows that open? I think like the high school, probably middle school may not have windows that open. Do we happen to know that just roughly? I don't, I don't know if any of the principals want to chime in. I think all the schools have windows that open. There may be some rooms in some buildings that may not. Um, is that accurate? Uh, I don't know. The high school would probably be my only question on some of that, but we I think we addressed, I think we addressed all that in the fall. Okay. Lisa, I'll call, uh, I'll ask you to unmute Lisa uh, McGuire. Yes, we do have a couple rooms that don't have windows, but we try to, to the best of our ability, relocate those teachers to rooms with windows for the year. Okay. That's good. For some reason, I felt like windows just didn't open in schools, but maybe I'm just old school. I don't know. That's good to hear. They I also, I also they think... Uh, open in Jenkins, oh. if I'm not mistaken. All right. Uh, Julie, Julie, can, Julie Ward, can you raise your hand? She's trying. <laughs> You have to unmute Julie. I know I need her to raise her hand. Under the participants. Hey, there I am. Um, so we were the building, we did have quite a few, you probably remember years ago, actually, before I arrived, uh, we had window issues. But last summer, we replaced um, so that most of the windows do open. We have a couple of old windows, but we put a new window next to them to make sure that we did have the airflow. Okay before this even started. That's great, thank you. Um, and the last question, probably for Dr. Dutch, but obviously we need, as uh, Superintendent Burke had mentioned, we need to get some additional equipment in terms of desks and so on. Is that something that we're hoping will be reimbursed by CARES or will it have an impact on our budget? And again, I hate to make it about money, but I just, just wanna know it's not gonna impact my decision. We, um, we will probably, use uh, ESSER two funds to uh, pay for the desks. Um, we're, we're, you know, we can delay on that till we get towards the end of the year and see where our reimbursements are and where our budget is. And if we can do it out of the budget and, and hold off on using ESSER two funds, then that would be the preference. But uh, if not, we have an alternative to all right, and, and again, this has this has this has zero impact on my opinion on, on what we should do. But just for planning purposes, assuming we do bring in a significant number of 
seats or desks, what, what would the longer term plan be to do with those, assuming we get back to normal at some point? I can answer that. You know, that was a question because we wanted to avoid one-time purchases, you know, and, and, and the prices of these things add up. So we were creatively thinking and um, quite honestly, um, this is a great two for one for us because these, the portable desks we found are outstanding. They're, they're very light. They're uh, made of plastic, but they're sturdy. They're, uh, they're adjustable in height all the way from high school to an adult to an elementary student. They're easy to store because they fold up. If you remember the kind of the TV trays, they're kind of like bigger versions of that, and sturdier versions that, that they could be used. Um, and we've had a need for these for uh, testing, for example, at MCAS testing, um, AP testing, PSAT, SAT testing. Um, it's always an issue finding uh, desks. So now we've, we've got a purpose to use, reuse these uh, over and over again. So we're getting a, our bang for a buck. So it's a, it's a worthwhile investment. Great, thank you again. Zero impact on on my decision, but just wanted to make sure that it was uh, that you know we brought it up. Um, I guess lastly, again, I just want to thank thank you, Superintendent Burke, and your entire team. Obviously, this is a collaborative decision. Um, took the expertise and time and information of all the appropriate parties and and provided the recommendation to us tonight. Um, for me personally, I'm in full support of the plan. I just wanted to mention that for me, I was ready to approve the return um, at our last meeting. And we delayed just waiting for additional details. But the real thing that for me that I just wanted to mention is that the announce, uh, announcing of prioritizing teachers has come out between that meeting and now. So that leads me to believe not only am I in support of this, but I obviously would you know, obviously encourage to even potentially you know, expedite it, but I'm not going to make that recommendation. I just, that's just how I feel. Um, again, I was comfortable in going back with this expectation without the vaccine, but now that we have the vaccine and, and based upon all the emails that I'm seeing, it sounds like teachers are really making an effort to get those back vaccinations done. Um, so with that being said, I'm in full support of the plan. Um, and I think just for the committee, we're just voting phase two, which is the March 29th return. Uh, I don't think we are ready to vote the uh, secondary plan yet. Um, so that's my comments. Um, anything else by the committee? Okay, with that being said, I will open up the public comments. I think that you all probably know the feeling uh, or the thoughts of the committee, so I don't wanna draw this out too long. Um, and I, I did note down the order of uh, hands that were raised for some reason, it scrambles it. So the uh, first one is Michelle Rama Pocha. I'll ask you to unmute and identify yourself, please. Again, name and address if you're not comfortable, uh, just your name and school affiliation. Hi, um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, this is Michelle Rama Pocha. I'm from 121 Sedgwick Drive, Hatherley School, Jenkins School, Gates Middle School. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I have like, you know, just a few comments and questions. So if you could just bear with me. Um, firstly, I, I just wanted to understand better about what the safety is for teachers. I, I know we talked a lot about the safety for um, the students. And of course that's, you know, very important. And we have the medical um, experts commenting on that. I just didn't really hear a lot of discussion about the teachers and maybe I just missed that part. So um, I have questions about that. And then I also wanted to know what the plans are for cohort C for the rest of the school year and for the beginning of the next school year. Um, the other thing is about distancing it just uh, a comment it just seems silly to talk about distancing with all the kids back in school because that's an unenforceable rule there's no way you're going to keep people any distance apart if all the students are back so it just seems like um an unenforceable rule um the the comment that i have in general is just that this <laughs> it seems like we're making a change at the very end of the school year, if this is voted, which it 
seems like it's a very strong likelihood that it will be. Um, and I'm reminded of the end of the last school year where we had a kind of a sudden change in curriculum toward the end when the students were just getting used to the way things were being done and it, it caused a bit of chaos um, for kids who were having to make a lot of adjustments in a short period of time at the same time being concerned about their health and you know what's going on around them um, so I don't understand exactly what the like it just seems like because there there is so much pressure and just a very vocal um, group of people demanding that schools reopen. Um, I feel like more evidence is needed to understand what the impacts could be for teachers. Also, schools that have reopened, like Marshfield, have had entire classes have to go back to quarantine because of positive cases. So I, it seems like we're going to be flip-flopping back between remote and full in-person. And that doesn't seem like it, it's the best uh, route to go. Um, you know, it's just not consistent and consistency, consistency is very important, especially for children who have special needs of which there are many. Um, so I just ask for, um, for folks to try to take a more measured approach. I understand the science is always changing and the uh, you know, a year ago, I remember almost, many time, medical experts on TV. Up, I'm, I'm just about I think, time. I think just, that's enough. I think, I think, I think um, that's enough sure. at this point. I think your, your points have been made. Um, I just would, I would just respond by saying we've just had medical experts on and they deemed that it, in their opinion, it's safe to go back with the proper measures in place. In response to, um, I think we've already addressed cohort C, there will, should not be any impact to cohort C, correct, Superintendent Burkhead? I, I think there's gonna be changes in, uh, slight changes in cohort C. Um, because now we have specialists coming back to work in school and right now they have the ability to do remote. So there'll be slight changes there where uh, they still will be serviced. I think the big commitment for us and that separates us from a lot of districts is that we're committing to having um, live teachers working with our students. So that's not gonna change. Um, some other districts have used technology or farmed it out like that. Um, so that will not change at all. Okay, thanks. And just um, again, this the, the public comment section is a is a comment section. It's not it's not designed to be a Q and A. However, um, I will ask Superintendent just to address very briefly um, some of the um, precautions taken uh, that the teachers will the guidelines for the teachers in order to remain safe. I think when we did our measurements, we showed we showed the class pictures there. All the teachers' uh, desks are at six feet and we're working to create a, a kind of a, uh, an alleyway, if you will, so they have as much six feet space. And in some classrooms, we're doing a whole around the whole perimeter of the, the classroom. They can have, you know, up to six feet space so they can move around as much as possible. Again, that also comes into when we do each classroom, the teacher feedback and working with the individual teachers and their comfort level uh, to make sure that they're not within, you know, this under the six feet or the three feet range for more than 15 minutes at a time if they so choose. So going over those uh, mitigation strategies. And like the doctor said, other than that, you know, wearing our masks and, and making sure that, you know, especially the younger kids that don't like to keep them on as a lot, a lot, you know, getting breaks and breaking up and chunking the day. And that's what good teaching is and where our teachers will be able to handle, you know, as we, you know, Ms. Brandolini said it, this is gonna be new for our kids, it's new for our teachers. It's a long day with masks on, just, you know, practicality of doing that, but we'll be prepared with, breaks and we'll adjust and overcome that, um, you know, but I, I think I'm very confident that, you know, we wouldn't be asking to bring kids back uh, unless we believe not only the students, but the staff was safe. Correct. And then lastly, just for clarification, um, our currently our high needs special or intensive special needs kids are already back for uh, four days, correct? Yeah, for four days in person. Yep. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, Actually, sorry, I think five, five. days, five days now, yeah, sorry. Five days. Okay, thank you. Uh, again, just a reminder, this part of the agenda is for public comment. We don't necessarily need to respond 
Um, I will kind of uh, hope to um, to deal with that as it comes up. And again, for some reason, the hands raised don't stay in order. I made note of a couple ones. I'm going to try to stay in order as best I can. The next up is Milena Davidova. Yeah, hi. Um, my name is Milena Davidova, and uh, I have a middle schooler and a high schooler. Um, my comment is that uh, last summer, I believe um, Mr. Bill Burkhead um, hosted a Q&A along with the principals, and that was immensely helpful in um, allaying uh, any anxieties and worries and concerns in a, a way where we as parents could get responses. And um, something that might be useful is to create such a Q&A for parents again and invite the medical experts that you had on today. I felt that the presentations that I was expecting according to the agenda um, didn't quite happen. Um, it was more of a free for all for <laughs> comments from the medical experts. And I would uh, feel better maybe seeing something a little more formal from them and also having the opportunity to ask questions. Um, and my second comment is, as a cohort C parent, um, I do wonder if there is any such plan to carry on with a cohort C option in the fall. I know that the previous commenter asked about that and that wasn't answered. I am not asking it as a question, um, I, it's a comment, <laughs> thanks. Great, thank you for your understanding. Um, I will not comment, but I would expect it next year. We will address next year at that point, but we, I think that it's a reasonable, it's a reasonable um, item to note. So thank you. Uh, okay, moving forward, Nicole Gracia, I will ask you to unmute. Hi, thanks, Peter. I am Nicole Gracia, co-president of the STA and a teacher at Jenkins. Um, just wanted to make a statement because lots of people have asked what the teachers are looking for, or what we're um, discuss not discussing in negotiations, but what we want as an STA. This week marks one year since we've experienced normalcy within our schools. For me, March 12th was one of those magically perfect school days we all love as educators. The connections I had made with my students were alive and well as they chose to eat their snacks around my desk and spend their free time by my side. It's hard for me to think back on that day without a feeling of great loss, but it was a perfect last in-person day with them and I am grateful to hold that memory close. Many have asked what we, the situate teachers, want in terms of reopening our schools. I can tell you that the memory I just spoke of is it. We want the ease of March 12th our minds fully able to focus on the students in front of us because we feel safe. Last week, we as STA leadership created a petition to Governor Baker, fervently requesting that all, work, all who worked within our school building were prioritized for vaccinations before the buildings are forced to open at full capacity. We are grateful that sites have opened up and more will continue to list educators as eligible this week. With each colleague who announces they've been vaccinated, we feel a tremendous sense of relief. As vaccination opportunities grow for our members, the return to a secure and safe classroom environment is in sight. The STA is committed to working with the school committee and administration to provide students and staff with the safety measures and strategies necessary to make this goal attainable. It has been a very difficult year for all of us, educators, administrators, caregivers, and students. Working toward the safest possible situation for our school personnel and our students has been our collective goal since we began this work last summer. The situation has been ever changing and I am proud to say that Situate Public Schools has weathered these changes together. The work has been collaborative, even at its most challenging moments and we are finally turning the corner. I know that we, educators, administrators and caregivers We'll reach the finish line as one unified team because we can all agree that our kids deserve nothing less. Thank you, Nicole. Okay. Thank you, Nicole. You're welcome. Okay, uh, I have definitely lost track, so I'm going to go to uh, a P. Scott. And if you are on hold or waiting with your hands raised, if you could make sure to name your handle. 
Uh, just makes it a little bit easier. I see one iPhone out there, and I just like to know your name before I call on you. But P. Scott. Uh, <clears throat> yes, thank you. And uh, I wanted to thank uh, everybody on the committee and the superintendent for all the information. Tonight, I, uh, being a pessimist, I guess, uh, and I, I try not to pose this as a question, but uh, I think the unknown issue at this point is the negotiation that Superintendent Burkhead is going to have with the STA for the next couple of weeks regarding the plan to open on March 29th. I think that decision is pretty self-evident at this point. So I don't want to ask a question of Superintendent Burkhead, but during your presentation, you showed a pie chart showing the teachers approximately 70 plus percent um, were comfortable going back to school, but with vaccinations. Um, was there any part of that survey that asked teachers their comfortability level or their willingness to return to the classroom um, without the vaccination being, being completed? Because obviously by March 29th, some teachers and staff are going to choose not to be vaccinated. Um, and some teachers that may want to be vaccinated aren't going to have the complete two-shot process by then. So um, just a question perhaps to the superintendent as to what his feelings are on the the willingness um, of the STA to, to go along with this plan. And I, I certainly realize that some of that information is privileged, but as a parent, um, my kids um, and their second and fourth grade at Cushing, I should have mentioned that, are gonna be all in, ready to go back. And the last thing I wanna see happen is uh, that not to happen on March 29th. Um, the second part of my question is, um, you know, I heard great information today from doctors, from superintendent, um, Mr. Hayes had mentioned that he was far away from um, having the older kids go back to school. Uh, I can be selfish and say I have a second and fourth grader. So as long as they're back, my, my, I'm happy. Um, but as if I were a parent of a fifth to 12th grader, I'd, I'd like Mr. Hayes to perhaps explain why he is far away, I think were the words that he used, from being willing to get the kids back by the April 12th date that the superintendent had mentioned. Um, I didn't hear anything from the doctors suggesting that these kids were at far higher, higher risk, uh, that they were going to be super spreaders. Um, and so I, I just had that question. I'm not sure how much superintendent can comment on the negotiation with our teachers. Um, I guess I would just comment that Desi came out and basically said that, uh, by April, what is it, April 5th, that all K through five needs, to, essentially needs to all be back in person. I'm not sure if that would satisfy your response, but I don't really want to put Superintendent Burkhead uh, in that position. Hopefully you can respect that. Absolutely. Um, in relation to Mr. Hayes, I'll let him, if you'd like to respond, Mr. Hayes, you do not need to. No, I'd be happy to. Um, my biggest concern is uh, vaccinating teachers especially in the gates in the high school. High school. Uh, I mean, there are some teachers, uh, Mr. Scott, who see 140 kids a day in the high school, five days a week. Uh, that concerns me. Uh, I uh, would be interested in seeing as we go forward, how many of our, our teachers and, st uh, and support staff have been vaccinated. And uh, that is, my main concern. Um, uh, my other concern is is that starting school uh, uh, before uh, April vacation gives me great concern. We've seen what happens uh, with cases during vacations. Uh, so that gives me a grave concern. Uh, uh, my other con my another concern is, um, uh, for example, our, our football team. Uh, first week of practice, they're in quarantine. Um, so th those are my concerns. Some of my concerns. My major concern is uh, opening up the gates in the middle school for full time education, without every single teacher who wants a vaccination being vaccinated. Mainly because of the size of the populations in the building and the amount of contact 
uh, between a great number, uh, a bigger number of students in the, those two schools uh, than the elementary schools. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Hayes. Again, I, I, I don't, I'm not, I cannot turn this into a Q&A. I want to give folks response where I can, but I don't want this to go on too long. Um, I'm sure that Mr. Hayes will have an opportunity to, to opine at our next meeting on the yeah, phase three open plan. Again, there's a lot of work to be done. As Mr. Burkhead had said, there's a lot of work to be done before we get to phase three. So yep. we'll see what happens. And again, I have full confidence in Bill and his team and uh, we'll see where we are at the end of the month. Yep. Great, thank you. All right, um, gonna go to Scott White. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi. Um, just want to say, you know, um, your, uh, address, please, Mr. White. Yep, 27 Acorn Street. I just wanted to say, um, you know, I agree it's, it's time to start sending the kids back to school. I think, you know, we've been living in this world for over a year now, and I think people are just not used to the fact that it's kind of coming to an end pretty rapidly. Yesterday, there was over 3 million people vaccinated in the U.S. That was a record high for us. Um, Three months ago, there was barely anybody vaccinated. Now 22% of the state is now vaccinated. There was just a recently an Israeli uh, case study published with Pfizer, over a million people in Israel, 600,000 people given vaccine, 600 got sick, 600,000 people not given the vaccine, 20,000 people got COVID. You know, and the president just announced uh, a few weeks ago that we're gonna have enough supply for the whole country by May. So I think you're just gonna see this come rapidly to the end where people are vaccinated and, and you know, what cases remain, remain. And I, like I said, I think it's just time to put these kids back in school as quick as we can. I think mentally it, it's very advantageous to get them back um, for their mental well being as soon as we can. Thank you. Uh, Robin Glazier. Hi, sorry. Um... Well, you know what the the speaker who just spoke. It's your address, uh, Robin. I'm so Please. sorry. It's a 26 per salmon, um, and I have high schooler, and um, I think the speaker who just spoke kind of pretty much said what I wanted to just include. Um, I also did just want to say that the Wednesday my my kid had her first in school Wednesday last week and was so happy. And it was so nice to see her happy. She actually was smiling, excited up early and had an outfit picked out. And she came home the same way. And, you know, it was just a Wednesday, but it, it obviously took on a whole new meaning. Um, and, and she wasn't the only one. A lot of her friends felt the same way. There is that mental health aspect that we've been seeing in the middle school and high school. And, you know, the very real fact is that people are standing in lines for months now on waiting lists for psychiatrists and therapists. And it probably was unavoidable. We had to do what we had to do in order to, uh, you know, deal with this pandemic. I think contemporaneously, now that teachers are getting access to the vaccines, and the numbers are what they are, they are, and the physicians are saying what they're saying. We can do both. We can take care of the teachers, get them vaccinated at the same time that we're starting to return the kids to school. I think that we're seeing less out of school behaviors that are unmasked when they're in school, obviously. Um, and so I just wanna also say thank you to Mr. Burkhead and the school committee and everybody because that report that Mr. Burkhead um, shared was very detailed and I appreciated the information. A lot of it is stuff that we just don't have on our radars. And lastly, I know that I suck as a substitute teacher and I know that my kids, my daughter loves her teachers and she's looking forward so much to having more of that. And I just wanna make sure that the middle school, the school does stay on the agenda. And I think in terms of their mental health, even seeing a targeted return date, a number, I think is such a light at the end of the tunnel for them. 
And I think even something that small has a positive impact on their mental well being. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, Katie Miller. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, Ken. Great. I live um, on First Parish Road and my son goes to the Cushing School. Um, first, I wanted to say thank you to our teachers and staff and administration. Um, it's impossible to fully convey how grateful I am to you for keeping my son safe in this challenging time. Um, tonight, I would like to urge members of the school committee to vote for an April 5th reopening for K through five, not March 29th. And I'll share why. We know that our mitigation efforts, masks and distancing work, and they work well because our educators are so diligent about creating a safe environment. On February 26th, the CDC wrote, vaccinating teachers and school staff can be considered another layer of mitigation. Our school personnel are committed to getting vaccinated. Last Wednesday morning when CVS announced it would follow President Biden's directive, RSPS teachers and staff jumped at this opportunity and it was all hands on deck. They worked as a team to get appointments booked already. Our teachers and staff have driven to Saugus, the Cape and Brockton for their vaccinations. And some are still struggling to get appointments. They are waking up early in the morning. They are having their husbands, wives, children help them get these vaccinations. We've all been there. We've all been on that online site waiting and refreshing our pages. They are getting vaccinated for themselves, but also to get our school buildings as healthy as possible for our children. Every day counts because we know it takes time to get to full immunization. I urge you to delay the full in-personing, full in-person till April 5th, five more days. Every day that goes by is a day our teachers and staff are more fully protected and therefore mitigating the risk to our children. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, Tom Esch. Hi there, I'm Tom Esch. We uh, have a second grader at Cushing and um, well, we've been in uh, cohort C and I guess I would offer hearing about plans with respect to specialists and other kinds of impacts on cohort C. I'd offer the observation and comment that uh, we sincerely hope that cohort C stays as robust uh, as possible um, and that it's very much on the front burner of people's thinking consistently in the process. I'm not suggesting it hasn't been, but I think um, the creativity and flexibility that we've seen so far, uh, we hope continues as we move into this next step. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's see here, Julie Hickey. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Just yeah. name and address, please. Yep. Yeah, um, Julie Hickey, I don't live in Pituate. I'm a teacher at the high school. Okay. Um, and I just wanted to um, add a comment. I appreciated um, the entire presentation and having the medical experts. And there was quite a few people that um, sort of pointed out all the things that were said um, by the doctors. Um, I think Mr. Scott had said I didn't hear anything from the doctors about the high school being more risky, something along that line. Um, um, I wanted to just point out that what I heard was um, Dr. E, I'm sorry, I, don't know, I can't remember his name, but it's, um, he said that, well, masks and ventilation were the key. And he went on to be very explicit about saying that well-fit masks, double-layered masks, um, were what mask uh, safety is defined as. And he also made a point of saying that um, he highly recommended 100% faculty vaccination if possible. I think he made a reference to in the hospitals, they had about 70%. He said that the goal should be for faculty to be vaccinated 100% based on those who want to. And I, I just, um, I wanted to reiterate that because I don't, I feel like he pointed those things out and. <laughs> I want to uh, underscore them and highlight them. And um, 
based on uh, what Katie Miller was just saying so clearly that um, I think the goal should be 100% um, vaccination for teachers uh, who all want to be. And I would love to know what the school, the town, the school committee, the district can be doing to help that. Um, you know, I know I have um, my brother and uh, sisters calling for me in the morning because I have to get my kids up and ready for school and out and I got to go in. And I know, like Katie said, so many people are doing that. And um, I wonder if there can be something that can be done collectively to, to help this happen. Like she said, um, you know, our, our health is a key piece. Our vaccination is key. And um, the reason I brought up the masks is my last point that I would like to make is um, I would love to have a, a real survey of the students um, at the high school to find out if they are wearing, you know, more than single layer masks, um, if they, you know, would be willing to share honestly how much they keep them on. Because um, I think as a teacher, when teachers um, share that they they have fears and concerns, um, having 140 students, um, it's hard to maintain and oversee while delivering your curriculum. Um, and it's the mask wearing and the ventilation that's going to be the key and the vaccine. So I'm sorry, I think I'm making the point over and over again. I just wanted to share that. So thank you. Okay. Thank you. I think I think we all agree that 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 we would love to be able to get all the teachers, all the staff, I should say, vaccinated. And and I can say that Superintendent Burkhead, um, Town Administrator Boudreaux, they they've been working on it. They're trying to, and and I think that it has to go notice that uh, I'm not sure it's purely coincidental that the state uh, prioritized teachers shortly after Superintendent Burkhead and his other superintendents wrote a letter. Um, so I want to give credit where credit is due. We've also included our uh, state rep, Patrick Kearney. He, as well as other representatives, did that. And it was shortly thereafter that teachers were prioritized. So I think there's a lot of effort going on. It probably continues on every day. Uh, I know you hear different towns getting different prioritizations. Um, and we're working on doing the same. So I think all of us here would, would like to see all of our staff members uh, vaccinated as soon as possible, and and, and we know uh, because we get the emails too that you're trying to get uh, you're trying to get vaccines, um, you're trying to get appointments, and trying to get assistance by your peers. So um, thank you. Uh, next up is Caitlin Monahan. Hi, thank you so much. Um, my comments are just kind of circling some of what has already been said. Um, I'm at 91 Front Street in the Harbor. Um, and I'm the daughter of a first grade teacher at Christian School, which I also attended many years ago. Um, and I also do research in the field of public health. And my research has recently focused on the impact of stress and anxiety among public school teachers specifically. Um, so I'm just here as an advocate for the teachers in situ public schools. Um, I understand that this is not a Q&A. Uh, but my comments and questions are in regard to the significant barriers to the vaccine in the state of Massachusetts, which I know has been discussed already. Um, and I'd also like to understand how we'll be addressing the unexpected and unpredictable behaviors among children, particularly children of younger ages, such as kindergarten through third grade, uh, namely in the elementary school. So for example, children who aren't washing their hands in the bathroom, uh, five and six-year-olds struggling with wearing a mask for over five hours at a time, uh, children are sneezing or coughing without covering their face, um, and I think we need to address the significant stress, anxiety, and depression, which our teachers may be facing, especially in relation to these behaviors, uh, and especially among teachers who have not been able to secure a vaccine yet. So um, I think we just need to include the perspective and experiences of teachers who we know tend to be um, feeling particularly unsafe without the vaccine. Uh, in the state of Massachusetts, 22% of public teachers are age 55 or older. And we know that those who are 55 or older consist of 80% of COVID deaths. So I completely understand that students and parents would like to return to the classroom, but unless our teachers are mentally and physically supported and fully vaccinated, I don't see a world in which uh, returning completely to the classroom is ethical, safe, and protective of the well-being of our teachers in situate. And I just can't imagine a situation in which we lose one of our cherished teachers who have done absolutely nothing but dedicate their lives and compassion to the town of situate. Thank you. Um... Moving on to final hand I have is Kate Martin. Hi, 
Hi, I'm Kate Martin. I'm a teacher at Cushing, and I know I've spoken at previous meetings, so I will try not to repeat myself. Um, going forward, I understand that many people feel that this is an easy first step to bring elementary students back. My main concerns come from the lack of time to plan. We have three weeks to plan the reopening, which I know to many of you seems like plenty of time. What I think is being missed is that while we are planning, we are also teaching two groups of students face-to-face -face and planning for the daily remote learning. On top of that, we have our normal duties of grading, and we are constantly working with students who are home through email and Google chat. We're working harder than we have ever worked before in order to make this hybrid learning model work. In these two weeks, we have only two faculty, or in these three weeks, we will only have two faculty meetings for the teachers to gather together to work with the principals to help with all that needs to be done. There is no extra time in a day to give. A return to school is not a return to normal. This is a new normal and we do not truly know what it will look like. We need all the time possible in order to be prepared for the safest return for our students. We need to plan to hallway travel, lunch, recess, bathrooms, mask breaks, arrival dismissal, and so much more. I strongly urge the district to change the return date to April 5th to match Jesse's requirements in order to give us one extra week to make this all work. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that will wrap up this portion of the public comment. Uh, I'll open it up to the school committee for any final comments or questions, and then I would entertain a motion. Any other comments or questions? Um, okay, uh, do I have a motion? Um, I can make I'll make a, a motion that the school committee approve phase two of the safe and strong reopening plan. A second. Motion by Mr. Hayes, second by Ms. Limblom. Uh, this will be a roll call vote. Ms. Brandolini? Yes. Mr. Long? Yes. Gates is a yes. Uh, Mr. Hayes? Yes. And Ms. Limblom? Yes. The motion passes five to zero. Excellent. Uh, a lot of work to do next couple weeks, next three weeks, but uh, I know the staff and the uh, everyone involved is up for the task and we'll look forward to uh, hearing more about it as we get closer. Uh, okay, now the uh, next item on the agenda, which usually witnesses a lot of comment as well, is the first reading of the school calendar which includes the first day of school. So we will transition right into that, uh, Superintendent Burkhead. Yes, thank you, Chairman Gates. Um, you all have a copy of the, um, the calendar, the first read of the calendar. Again, very rough draft. Uh, basically what this is, is um, a transfer over of everything from this year uh, for you to look at, comment, and um, give your feedback for future drafts if necessary and changes. Um, with Labor Day, um, I guess we'll start at the beginning with Labor Day on November 6th, there's a Monday. You'll see that uh, in that week prior, we have a lot going on with uh, new teacher orientation uh, and then professional development um, days for teachers the week prior. So the first day of school would be um, August, um, September, excuse me, September 7th. And then the first day for kindergarten would be the 8th. And the first day of early childhood would be the 13th. Um, then the, um, the next holiday would be uh, Columbus Day. And I know there's been some questions on the Columbus Day holiday. Um, we're again, going after what we had last year and this is still a a recognized holiday as it's named. So that's why that's there. Um, in November, you have Veterans Day, there's no school. And then the Thanksgiving break, which is traditional with a uh, half a day on the 24th before Thanksgiving. You've got early release days kind of sprinkled out monthly in there as well. 
Um, then you have um, the winter break. The I think uh, most contracts have the day before. Um, Christmas falls on the 25th is a Saturday. So the 24th is a day off there. And students uh, and staff return on January 3rd. The um, Martin Luther King Day on the 17th of January. Um, February is traditional uh, vacation during President's Day for February vacation. Um, and the 1PD Day in March was strategically placed there because it's the um, biggest gap between days off. So we wanted to kind of get a good run of, of, of student learning in there and uh, didn't want to have a month where we were missing any more days and March seemed to be the ideal month. And that's kind of been traditional as well. It's also a, a time of year where uh, we're poised to kind of uh, use the data we have for the current year and use that in our professional development learning. In April, um, April 15th is no school, Good Friday. Uh, and traditional April vacation starts with Patriots Day on the 18th. Uh, into May, Memorial Day is a traditional holiday, no school. And the last day of school, the 180th day of school would be June 17th by this calendar. That's similar to this year's date. Um, and then you have um, on the 20th, you have this, um, Juneteenth observed, which is recognized by the state. And that's there. Uh, technically, we're done on the 17th. In case we get snow days, which go into the following week, that Monday would not be an option to reconvene school. So we would kick it uh, any snow days into the 21st, 22nd, 23rd, 24th, and 27th if necessary. So that's the <laughs> overview. I'll, I'll take any questions, comments. Yeah, I know this is, this is always a, <laughs> this is always a meeting that takes a lot of time, especially when, uh, or this topic, I should say this, um, the first day of school is obviously the biggest one. Do we start before or after Labor Day? And historically, we generally start after Labor Day, but when it's late, like it was this past year and then this upcoming year, uh, it makes it more difficult. Um, I know you're aware of this, Superintendent Burkhead, but I just, I just want to mention it. Um, the, the seventh, the projected first day of school is Rosh Hashanah. Um, but I, I, I understand that. Um, just wanted to make mention of it and make sure the school committee members were aware as well. Um, and then I think also, as you mentioned, I think that we need to be, this doesn't necessarily dictate the days, but I think that we need to come to some some conclusion at some point end of this year, maybe when we have a DEI coordinator on how we name our holidays, um, including Columbus Day and Good Friday and, and those sorts of things. So I'm not, not necessarily concerned about that right now. I think really what's at stake today, I believe is just the first look at the calendar and really what the first date is. So I know that people want to plan for that. Teachers want to plan, families want to plan. Um, so without any comments or questions by the school committee members. I'm good for, for tonight. I, I, I have a couple of questions. Um, sure, go ahead. Just out of curiosity, uh, Bill, has there been any kind of talk from the superintendents about, you know, and this, this question is asked, I think, every year about, you know, doing away with February and April and just making like one vacation in March? Because it would have to, you know, every the, we all would have to be on board. There is not. <laughs> okay. That would be a trick. You know, I know the colleges do it spring break in March. Uh, um, it's no, it hasn't gotten a lot of momentum. It's not something that's talked about a lot now and then it might be brought up around this time of year with calendars, but uh, not really holding any traction. Okay. And um, I do have a comment that kind of is um, piggybacks on what Peter was saying about holidays, um, you know, the correct naming of holidays. And, um, and I know this will probably be an, a very unpopular opinion, but I mean, every year I wonder, you know, we have, um, we give, we have Good Friday off, but, you know, we don't have any other holidays for any other religions. 
Um, and I know the argument was that, well, a lot of people take part in services on Good Friday, which, you know, do, what do we do for people who don't, um, who have to take time off for their, you know, other religion, uh, other, other ceremonies that they, you know, that we have, we have school in session. You know, do, do we excuse that absence, correct? Yes. Yeah. So I don't know. I think at some point we need to look at, you know, are we being fair to people? You know, we're not, you know, we have people of many religions that may feel, you know, that they can't take part in what they need to do. But here we are giving Good Friday off. Sorry, I know that will make people's minds explode, but <laughs> I felt it had to be said. So. Thank you. Uh, I I agree, Miss. I, I think that it's 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 never an easy it's never an easy discussion. I think that every year we just push it off till the following year. Uh, no, no. But um, I, mean, I think about no, it. No, I agree. I mean, I I celebrate Rosh Hashanah, and it's you know, and, and the, the, but then there's other ones. There's there's um, Yom Kippur, which is also in September. You know, so there's there's that, and then you have, so if you just don't give any of them off, that's probably the fairest thing to do. But Right. Is it is it real is is it realistic to do that? I don't know. Um, I, mean, I mean, I would you know wh why can't we give you know any holiday that any why can't we give any any family or any staff member a time off that helps them you know allows them to celebrate whatever however they celebrate you know let them do what they need to do. Um, yeah, but so are you saying that to add holidays or just to not have any holidays? Um, well, I think we need to talk about that. I mean, it's, I don't, I just would hate to have any family or staff member feel like they can't take time, the necessary time off just because it's not like Good Friday. Right. You know, that so clearly is a Catholic holiday. So you know, what are we, what kind of message are we sending to people that celebrate other, other um, religions? Right. So, that's all. Right. We, you know, why not start another controversy? <laughs> All right. Any other uh, comments? This is just the first reading. I think typically we'll, I don't know, we could have two or three on this. You know, it's, it's usually about the first day, but I think we have some, you know, as our initiative on DEI, I don't know if we're in position to really determine the holidays on our calendar quite yet, but I think that we definitely no. something we need to do. I think, yeah, I think we need to, have that discussion at some point. I agree. Mm -hmm. And it would yeah, also make sense to find out if any other towns are doing are having those conversations as well. I mean, I I, I agree with Janice that I mean, families and staff need to feel comfortable taking those days off if as a, not being penalized because of their you know religious beliefs. But mm -hmm. if we add every holiday to the calendar, we'll never get through the end of the school school year. Right. So. Right. Balancing that and doing it appropriately is, you know, obviously something right. to consider. But Superintendent Burkett, I would actually be interested to see if, if any other districts are having these same conversations. Yeah, we can look that up. I, I did share in your, I think you have in your backup the, uh, the Columbus Day holiday, what school districts have voted that. And so we can do the same for Good Friday if that's what you like. I would imagine if you take away, if you do like, a, I don't know, we need to talk about this now, but I mean, you would get so many staff that would choose to take that day off and we wouldn't have um, subs for yeah. hundreds of people that, you know, I, I completely understand your points for sure, but yeah. I would imagine that's probably what would happen. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know. Yeah. No, I agree with Nicole. I, I mean, I think. Yeah. It, it, I mean, Good Friday is, is it's more than a Catholic holiday uh, day. It's a Christian day, however. But uh, I think the reason historically we've done this is is a practical uh, reason as far as the amount of people that mm -hmm. would need to uh, man the schools uh, would be very difficult on Good Friday. Uh, um, so it's, it's it, it practical, but I do think Janice and, and, and Pete and Mike and Nicole and Bill, it's, it's a worthwhile dis discussion before we finalize the 
calendar. Yep. And okay, the only other comment I would have in Superintendent Burke, I know this is this is your first time going through. I apologize. You've had to deal with everything. Um, and this is not this is I think historically the Friday before la uh, before Labor Day has been a non school day. Um not for discussion now, but just to maybe get some history on that to see if, you know, see if we can use that as a school day potentially. I, I know that's a long shot, but I just at least wanted to throw it out there for our review. It's a good point, Pete. Yep. We'll do. Again, I'm just trying to gain, we're just, I think all of us just trying to gain days because I mean, with this calendar, yes, if we have, if we have a couple of snow days, we're not going to get out until the, the last week in June. That's way too late. Um, I know we did surveys before on what people, what community uh, surveys, and I think it was nearly split, which did not help yeah. decision making last year. No. no. <laughs> Should we go back before after Labor Day? It was like so close. It <laughs> did not no. help. I know. So again, there's no easy decision, but we just, I mean, I don't, I don't really want the kids to be go or anyone to be in school the last week of June. That's just too late. Yeah. In my opinion, but again, I don't know. We'll, have to Post, figure it out. well, after a pandemic, maybe maybe people have different views. Maybe we should <laughs> get a pulse on that again. I don't know. Yeah, I think so. Right. Many other school districts go back before Labor Day. I mean, it's. I think we're one of the few. Yeah. Uh, or you know, maybe it's like seventy-five. Mm. Uh, but I think I think some years warrant going back depending on where that you know labor yeah right i think this year more than any if we can get back full in person we should get back as soon as we as soon yeah. as they can probably okay so there you go super Dan Burke. add it to your list thank you the review. <laughs> you probably <laughs> it's it's never an easy one it really should be but it's just not yeah, nope. maybe next year it will be easier i don't i don't know we right. love to take things that are supposed to be boring and make them really, really exciting. Yep. It's what we do best. And I, it's not uncommon that this conversation, I think in any district I've been in, these are all been uh, conversation points. So it's, this is not unusual. So um, let me bring back more information for you. These are great points and questions. And, um, you know, we can have a more detailed conversation with more information for next meeting. Okay. All right. Any other questions or comments right now? All right. Seeing none, we will move forward with the agenda. Uh, this is Dr. Dutch, the old business, the fiscal year 2022 school budget. I think he had mentioned before there are no changes. Correct. Uh, the, the budget was presented at the budget hearing at your last school committee meeting. There have been no changes to that budget. Um, so I would look for a motion to approve the budget as presented uh, with the total. Could you, um, I'd just be curious, Dr. Dutch, could you just review for, for the committee and for those that are still on the call, um, your, what you did between the time you presented and now, meaning who you presented it to uh, in regards to the other town committees? I think that's just helpful for folks to understand. Sure. Um, so after the budget hearing, uh, superintendent and I presented the budget to the select board, uh, answered their questions. And then on the Thursday night after we presented to the advisory committee for their review uh, and answered any questions they had as well. So we've, we've presented it uh, four times now, once to the uh, to the budget workshop, to you, the committee, once to the public, to the public hearing, and then to the last two groups that I mentioned. Great. And uh, did you, any any particular comments or questions that stood out? Um, most of the comments were related to our out of district costs and getting an understanding of that um, and how we were were managing that. Oh. And then also there were some questions um, related to uh, the, the free kindergarten and how we were able to do that as well. So we clarified 
how that came about. Great. Are there any uh, comments or questions from the committee on the budget? Very exciting. We could be voting in free kindergarten. <laughs> yep. I just want to. Um, Rose Montmire. If I may, Pete, uh, we have a financial forecasting committee meeting tomorrow night. And uh, there are some uh, new developments, but I do not. It's. Uh, I can't, and I can't open two screens at once on the Chromebook, at least I can't. So my memory is, is that that did not change our bottom line. Um, but uh, if it does, um, um, <clears throat> well, this may have to be, uh, the, the final number may have to be an, right. amended uh, uh, before town meeting, so. Unders that's, I, I, I think that that's, uh, uh, I can't hear Bob. Yeah, I, I can't hear Peter. It was Peter who was talking. I guess what I what I would say in it relation well. to that, Mr. Hayes, is uh, if if that number changes coming from the town, just as some of our grant numbers may change, right? Any any excess funds, I would recommend uh, we move we we move towards a special ed stabilization account if it ends up being surplus at the end of the fiscal year. Uh, it, it may be helpful just to cover any unanticipated costs in special ed uh, that, that you know may come about from someone moving in. Sure, no, no, no I agree. I, you know, I just wanted to bring that up, and and I'm ready to vote the numbers. Certainly. Okay. Yeah, no, Mike. I think I think that's good. I would just I would just try and do a timing. Obviously, if that number changes, we have another meeting. We right. have another two meetings before timing. So yeah, we have plenty of time. And I would agree. We should sure. probably vote it now, and then if it changes, we can. I agree. Amend it. All right. So with that, do I have a motion? Who has the number in front of them? <laughs> I have. I'll I'll read it. In, uh, you can bring it up. <laughs> uh, do I, I have, have it, Peter? Okay, go ahead. So I move to approve the FY 2022 school budget in the amount of $44,646,633 as presented. Motion by Mr. Long, second by Mr. Hayes. Uh, roll call vote, Ms. Limblom? Yes. Ms. Brandolini? Yes. Gates is yes. Uh, Mr. Long? Yes. And Mr. Hayes? Yes. Great. Motion passes five to zero. Thank you for your work. Uh, hopefully we don't see it again until town meeting, but if we do, we'll be willing and okay. ready. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. Moving forward, the agenda, our leadership, re uh, leadership report, director of special education, uh, Dr. Michelle Bober. Good evening. Thank you for allowing me to present. I'm going to try to share my screen and I'm going to try to uh, channel Nicole and make what something could be boring and make it fun and exciting. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, let me see if I can do this. Um, all right, you probably can't see that, can you? No. All right, hold on. Can you see that? Anybody? Can you see? Um... Yeah, we can see it. Okay, thank you. We can see it. Let me just share that. Okay. All right. So, um, oops. There we go. That's probably good. Okay. So, what I am going to do is just do a brief update on special education grants and an update on the circuit breaker audit that we had. So um, I'm gonna start by just explaining that um, there are different kinds of grants. So we have federal grants, we have state grants that are actually usually provided through federal money or we have private grants. So of our federal and state grants, they could be an entitlement grant um, or an allocation grant, which are the best kinds because you just tell them what you 
want. They give you so much money and you're guaranteed to get that money as long as you write the grant correctly. A targeted grant is basically where the department has decided there's a need and it might be um, just certain districts would be targeted to receive that grant. Um, a competitive grant is where um, you would apply for a grant and um, you may or may not get it. Usually all private grants are also competitive, but there are a fair amount of uh, grants from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education that are also competitive in nature. Um, one of my philosophies is that it's really important in writing these grants to collaborate with others. Um, special ed does not exist in a vacuum and we can get a lot of bang for our buck if we integrate our initiatives and work together. Some of the grants are focused solely on program improvement. So as much as we might want to hire people to work with students, a lot of times the, the DESE's targeted grants are created in a way that would help us build staff capacity. And um, so they're focused on professional development and they're usually short term kind of grants. Um, so the program improvement grants, again, are really more about professional development, um, occasionally services for students with disabilities as well. So this little picture here just talks about um, diversity, differences and disabilities, because I know that is a focus on um, Situate's work this year is diversity. One of our, the big, the big grand aid, Granddaddy grant of all is the Grant 240, which is the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. And that is based on the number of students that we have that are on IEPs as of October 1, the, the uh, previous year. So that one, this year we were given $744,109. That is an entitlement grant. We use the money to support the salaries of one paraprofessional, the partial funding for our Orton Gillingham reading teacher consultant. We also use the funding for independent evaluations, for supplies, for instruction, and for testing. We use a lot of the money for out of district tuitions and also for special education participation. And then we used a little bit for professional development and for a proportionate share. So proportionate share is a federal law that um, basically says that we need to look at the number of students we have in Situate that are on IEPs that attend the Situate public schools and then also look at the number of students who um, reside in Situate but attend private schools at parent expense. So schools like the Inley School or Catholic schools or um, you know, non-public schools. And then what we need to do is we divide the number of students, which um, October 1 was four students that were on IEPs attending other schools or homeschooled by the number of students that were on IEPs. And that is the, proportionate, the proportion of the federal grant that we need to reserve and spend on those students' um, IEP services or consultation. So it's a complicated formula, um, but that is what proportionate share is. So even though it's an entitlement grant, there are certain things that the state says that we have to spend money on. The other big um, grant that we get every year, which is an, another entitlement grant, is the Early Childhood Special Education Grant. And we use that money to fund the salary or partial salary of one paraprofessional in our early um, childhood center. This year, there are a couple of new grants. These were targeted grants. So these were basically, I believe most districts were um, targeted for that based on COVID-19. So one of them was the early childhood targeted special ed grant. And again, it's pr a program improvement grant, but they also added safety because of COVID. And uh, we use those, that money for supplies for students that are between the ages of three and five um, in special ed and um, mostly focused on some specialized math and reading materials and cubbies and other kinds of supplies. 
the other grant that we got that was a targeted grant was um, the special ed program improvement grant that was for $17,422. We used most of the funds for um, a contracted speech and language therapist to help cover the speech and language therapy needs of our students. And then we used some of the funds for books to support professional development, mostly focused on behaviors as well as cultural sensitivity um, and being culturally responsive. So we have Jessica Minahan that is coming that is funded by Course, um, who's a BCBA who um, talks about anxiety and behaviors. And so one of the things that I want to do with this grant was to kind of expand our learning and purchase her book, um, The Behavior Code. I also got some books that were on um, equity and behavior and also culturally responsive teaching in the brain. And so these are books that um, I was able to get, not one for every teacher, unfortunately, but enough to have like a little um, lending library at each school. Um, another grant that I applied for, we haven't heard yet, we should be hearing in a couple of weeks, is the Allison Keller grant. Um, I applied for $7,374 and that is um, funded through the Flutie Foundation. And it's really about making sure that students with autism have technology. So I requested um, iPads, iPad cases, learning apps, as well as a ceiling mounted um, projector for one of our special ed uh, classrooms. So that's an example of a private grant. I'm not sure I'll, that we'll get it. I did apply for this grant about, um, I don't know, eight years ago and Mashpee was able to get it. And um, so, we'll see. Another grant that is coming up that is due in a week or so is the Significant Disproportionality in Special Education Grant. We, in situate, we were found to over-identify students that are coded as either Black or African-American as having a communication disability so um, those students were much more likely to be identified with that kind of a disability compared to white students. It is a common phenomenon in the state of Massachusetts. We've been participating with um, a DESE sponsored professional learning community with other districts to kind of learn more about it and identify root causes of that. And we are working on a district action plan I want to thank um, the other staff that are working on this committee with me, including the, um, Ryan Beatty, um, Julie Ward, Rebecca Long, and our team chairs, um, Deb Sullivan and Rose Fellini. And so we're, you know, kind of working together on that. Um, this grant will help continue uh, to support that work. Um, there is a uh, training coming up that we hope to be able to attend virtually and um, in terms of the actual grant again um, looking at buying more books supporting professional development perhaps having a um, trainer come in to talk about um, communication and being more culturally um, appropriate and also partnering with our METCO director Michelle Crawford uh, by contributing towards um, a program that she has uh, applied for that we were able to start work on it's called Harvard Rides Equity Improvement Cycle. So that is exciting. Um, again, another um, requirement of our 240 grant for next year because we were found to have this issue with um, our over identification is that we need to make sure that we reserve a percentage of our grant next year to make sure that we are providing early intervening services to reduce that disproportionality. That will be for next year's grant. Um, the circuit breaker audit, I just wanna give you a, a brief update. We finally finished the audit process on March 2nd. There was an overall reduction of almost $50,000 to the claim that was submitted last summer, but we will still receive about a um, million one hundred thirty thousand this year that is down um, about 75,000 from last year. 
So some of the issues were um, there wasn't a documentation on IEPs for one-to-one uh, -one paraprofessionals that were claimed. Some other issues, including not uh, not completing the file properly to demonstrate a cost share, and also um, for claiming students that attended out of district programs during the summer when they did not. So I remember when I did the circuit breaker presentation, I think um, Mr. Gates, you asked if it's like the IRS, are you more likely to be audited? Unfortunately, yes, we are more likely to be audited. So uh, next year, but have a little pot of gold here. It's, um, it is something and it is certainly helpful to uh, have this money from the state um, through the grants and through the um, circuit breaker to support our students with disabilities. So if we get, these are all the grants we're gonna have this year. And then these are the two um, here that we have not yet um, received, but hopefully we'll receive the disproportionality grant. Um, so in total, we, um, we get this much funding from the state and that's a little pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. So. <laughs> All right, so thank you very much. I will um, see if you have any questions. That's great, Dr. Wolf. I mean, I, I think like you referenced in the call, like, yeah, you can make some simple things very complicated and exciting, but I, that stuff is great information. I, I really like it. I think probably it, it's probably new for a lot of folks, um, but I think it's really important. And again, this is why we brought, I will say as a committee, we brought in a new administration um, to resolve situations like this. Uh, we appreciate all the extra effort and time you put into doing it um i'm sorry that there were some issues um, but glad they were able to resolve them um in regards to that i guess in terms of the new grants that you submitted how do we i'm just curious how we how we account for them maybe dr dutch could help um in terms of our budget obviously doesn't affect our budget because you receive oh, the grant and then we just buy it. But I'm, I guess I'm just curious how that, how that gets accounted for. And then how the, the X or the, the 50,000 roughly that we essentially had a return or not receive from circuit breaker, how that all works out from the budget perspective. Well, the yeah, right, right. So the money that we receive for circuit breaker is money that we receive uh, quarterly this year but it's sort of banked towards next year's tuition. So if, if it dropped significantly and we were unprepared for that, yeah. then um, you know, that might impact our budget, but it is, it's in, still in the ballpark for what Dr. Dutch had um, projected for next year. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so it's fine. I mean, we were able to find some money that we didn't claim for so, um, so that helped or could have been a lot, a lot um, more of a reduction. Um, I, you know, I, some of the, you know, the concerns that I have are like the disproportionality, like we have to reserve 15% of that for mm -hmm. certain things. And so like that would then take away from other things. And so the grants have to be a little bit fluid, but we kind of count on the grant for the tuition and the transportation and certain key um, people. But in, that's why those other grants are kind of like extra. They're more about professional development because we, we can't really count on them. But the 240 we count on and the circuit breaker we count on. Okay. Well, Dr. Dutch, do you have anything else? Yeah, just, just in relation to, well, first in relation to circuit breaker, um, we budgeted about $200,000 less than what we're getting, what it appears as though we're getting this year. So uh, we, we should be fine um, knowing that down the road, if we have fewer out of district students as we, we hope to, um, that, that number will be accurately reflecting uh, what, what we're receiving. Um, as far as the, the smaller competitive grants that um, Dr. Bobert has, has gotten. Those are reflected in our budget after the fact when we do our end of the year report. Um, and if kind of like uh, Ms. Lindblom had mentioned, can we get rid of the grant that, uh, 
that we don't get any more out of the budget, and, and we've done that. There are other grants that you know we'll get this year and we won't get next year. So you won't see them regularly as part of the budget until we know that, that we're gonna be getting them on a regular basis. These are, are often one-offs uh, and are very competitive and, and therefore don't show up for a district multiple times. Okay. So it's helpful. Just uh, this is great information. It's tough. It, it, I, I think it's great. Um, I just like to know the, the mechanics of it all. So I appreciate that. But ultimately, this is all for the benefit of our students and our special ed population. So it's it's ultimately really good news. Um, any comments or questions by the committee? I, I have a quick question, Peter. Sure, Ms. Lindblom. Um, so the, the grant for the uh, from the Flutie Foundation, is it, do we, um, is that like an all or nothing? Would you get like a part, like some funding or is it, um, do you expect to get, if they approve it, would they give you all of it or would you? I think, I think they would give us all of it. The max was 7,500. So mm -hmm. I came in a little bit under. And when I did uh, apply in Mashpee and got it, we got the full amount, mm -hmm. but you never know. They, they may decide, you know, if they had a lot of people and the other thing is like that's sort of a revolving so that grant's been around for a while so mm -hmm. we don't get it this time and and there's a need you know i can always apply again mm -hmm. all right thank you any yeah. other comments yes mr hayes real quick and, and michelle thank you uh, uh i think everyone will agree we all get a little smarter when we after we hear your presentations <laughs> and uh certainly i think a lot of the uh parents who uh, join us on these Zoom meetings. Uh, it certainly uh, adds to their knowledge of, of everything, and uh, so we all we all get smarter. But um, I've been doing um, some reading lately uh, on a group, and and this is for you and 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 Bill and 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 Bob as well. Uh, New profit is a is a philanthropy. Uh, group in Massachusetts um, with with lots of money. And I, I, I don't know if, if they advertise grants that are interesting to uh, for public schools so much as, as maybe bigger entities. I know they do a lot of work with, uh, with colleges. Um, but I was wondering, and, and this specifically, one of the focal points of, of their philanthropy is in the diversity, equity, inclusion area. So um, I was just curious, in, and again, I had never heard of them until last week, and, and I've been reading a lot about them. Um, and they, they, they give over $2 million a year uh, to various schools and groups. So I just didn't know if uh, that, that was something on our radar that could uh, help us either, you know, in 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 various uh, areas. Uh, but I'm especially interested in whether uh, it's something that's on our radar regarding diversity, equity, and inclusion. I have not heard of new profits, yeah, so I me, think that would I be a good me. thing to research. Yeah, it's quite a group. Nor have I, Mr. Hayes, but thank you for bringing it to our attention. We're always looking for other resources. So we'll, we'll yeah, look into that. A Massachusetts philanthropy. So great. Uh, yeah. Thank you. And I, I'm still reading on them. So I'll, if I find anything else more, I'll let you know. Yeah. If you find out the quickest way to get the money <laughs> and for a good cause, give me that secret too, please. But they, they do a lot of work, Bill. And, 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 and I know we have great consultants on diversity, equity, inclusion, but that is one of their focal points uh, in uh, it's an education uh, uh, based group. Uh, uh, and, and they specifically uh, try to help schools with uh, with those issues. So it, it's certainly worth looking into. And I'll keep Absolutely. looking as well. Thank you very much. Great, thanks. Uh, any other comments or questions? My good. No, I, I, I <laughs> Dr. Bober, I, lo I love these presentations. Again, I know it's not the most exciting for many folks, but I think you get, I think, I think that it's, uh, you like presenting, you enjoy it, help educate, as Mike said, you really are educating us and everyone else that's here. I think it's, you know, 
Special Ed is a significant part of our budget, and I think that it's important that we make it a priority uh, at our meetings that you have. So thank you. Um, all right. With that, we will move on to our second and final uh, portion of public comments. I did see one hand earlier, but I do not see it any longer. If you do have a question, you can go into the uh, participant option, scroll over to the right side of your name, and you'll see an option to raise your hand. Seeing none, flying right through. We, um, we took out of order. We did the acceptance of the minutes, item eight. We did the subcommittee reports, number nine. I have correspondence, which is way late, and I apologize. However, I don't know if all of you received as well, but I did receive Valentine's Day cards. Oh, yeah. From um, Wampatuck. So I just want to acknowledge that I did receive them. I apologize for the delay in so doing, but I do have them and uh, very much appreciated. Uh, Wampatuck School, fifth. Uh, fourth grade. Thank you. Uh, any other correspondence? All right, seeing none. And we did uh, warrants out of order. Any other business? No other business. Uh, future agenda items. Our next meeting is March 22nd. Um, on that, we will uh, we'll formally put on the uh, policy first. Uh, first read through. Uh, we will look at school calendar. And I also have on here school choice, which I believe we have to vote on each year. Um, any other, anything else before the committee they'd like to discuss? Yeah, I had one. Um, as looking forward to our next meeting, um, is there a proper way or, uh, to determine uh, prior to our discussion on phase three as to how many teachers have been vaccinated by that date. Either through the administration or the union. Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, Superintendent Burkett or Kelly. I, I think we can all, work the, all the yeah, union. Yeah, I think we'd have to work with the unions that it's be good information private, private information but we can certainly no i understand private but it'd ask be, people to volunteer it yep sure. yes we can do that just i mean anonymous numbers would be great yeah i think that's a good idea uh, right now we have 57 people that have started the process just if that helps that have started yep that have had at least one dose oh really okay and that's a voluntary offering. I just put an email out and asked um, if people right. would be willing to share that with me. So that was voluntary. That's what we know Great. so far. Great. Excellent. And and I don't know if this matters. And I, obviously, uh, do we, Superintendent Perkins, did you put out a question or were you debating a question of how many staff would not, is not interested in a vaccine? And I'm not sure that really matters, but just curious. And again, I know that that's private information, but, you know. Um, be interesting as well. We did ask that. I don't recall off the top of my head. I don't know. Um, Dr. McGuire, do you remember what that number was? It's okay if you didn't. We can get we can get it back to you. But we did ask that question. Yeah, I thought you did. I was just I was just curious. And again, I know that you know, I think it's just helpful. Um, yep. You know, and to get the total not this, it's all. It's not just teachers. It's all staff, correct? In okay. schools, correct. It's not just teachers who are eligible. Right. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so I think it just helps give some perspective on the numbers of, you know, maybe we have 95% that are that want it and the other five don't. Just helps us. Absolutely. And, and I think that's what Dr. Ellerum was, was um, commenting about when he was saying 70%. Not all hospital employees choose to get it. And so I think encouraging people and providing them with facts and, and good information about the vaccine, um, I, that as the vaccine is coming out, those numbers of skeptical people are growing. So I would anticipate to see that number grow as well if we have okay. those folks concerned in our, in our district. Great. Okay. Um, any other comments or questions or items before you that you'd like to discuss? 
It is 921. If not, I would take a motion to adjourn the school committee meeting at 921. So moved. Motion by Mr. Hayes. There's second. Second. Second by Mr. Long. Roll call vote. Ms. Brandolini. Yes. Ms. Limblom. Yes. Uh, Gates is yes. Mr. Hayes. Yes. And Mr. Long. Yes. All right.